Hello, everyone. Monday, December 5. I don't know why I picked that song. I just picked that song because I like it. Very uplifting. I don't know about you guys, but recently I've been um, increasingly playing more music. It really gets me fired up and uh, out of my uh, personal thinking. I realized the last couple of years I haven't been listening to enough music. Uh, everything for classical music. I went to the new David Geffen Hall, the refurbished, remodeled Geffen, David Geffen Hall on Saturday night. Um, saw a couple terrific, uh, heard a couple terrific pieces by New York Philharmonic. I like all kinds of music. I just find it very uplifting and um, helps with mood adjustment. So there. At any rate, we got a great room today. Arjun, I see you're waiting there. I'll bring you in in one second. Um, as is customary, we do our three days from history, and then we we'll get into it. So, number one, I didn't realize this, but on December fifth, nineteen oh, uh, December fifth, nineteen oh one, Werner Heisenberg and Walt Disney were actually born on the same day. I didn't know that. December fifth, nineteen oh one. So there, there's your useless factoid of the day. In 1933, Utah ratified, um, I think I got this right, the 36th Amendment, and I got the number written down wrong, which uh, repealed uh, prohibition. And then finally, in uh, 2013, Nelson Mandela passed away. Oh, my God. Hard to imagine. It's already been nine years. You know, I, I don't read enough history. I don't think most of us do. That's why I've started with this new habit recently of uh, reading three dates from history. All right, let's get Arjun in here. So it is a real pleasure to have Arjun here. Arjun and I go back, oh my God, uh, 20 years more. And I, as I was DMing with Arjun, we have not scripted this. It's going to be free form. Um, I have very fond memories of Arjun from his Goldman days. Um in the late 00s, he was the guy who called oil to 150. And we'll go through the we'll go in the way back machine. But, um, you know, on the sell side, guys are often somewhat constrained in what they can say or what they're willing to say. And Arjun was kind of a free spirit. So I really, really, really enjoyed listening to him. Um, one of my favorite analysts. And I'm even more excited now that he's unchained from Goldman. The real Arjun Murdy can stand up. So Arjun, good to see you, my friend. How you been? Long time. George, George I'm do I'm doing well. It's great to uh, great to hear you, and uh, I have many fond memories as well. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, back. I was always the wise guy asking the annoying questions in the Goldman Conference Room at, on High Street. So there you go. <laughs> so we, so so we didn't we didn't we didn't script this. Um, there's so much to talk about. Um, I don't know where you want to go. I can start with questions, or maybe just. If you have a rant you want to go on, or if there are a few couple points you want to you, you want to start with at the top, I mean, we need not get into the Captain Obvious stuff, but I, but but you know clearly, energy markets are in transition. There's a long term secular case, and you've written extensively on this, um, and and you've been very outspoken, and I, and I applaud you. And it really falls to folks like yourself who've been around the block a few times, who who understand have the have the context, understand history. To speak out because I'm just I'm just dismayed by this extreme short term uh, focus on so many uh, not just investors, politicians, policymakers, and so I think yeah you know there's a short term yeah what's going to happen the world's going into recession maybe maybe China you know on even number of days China's reopening on odd number of days they're going to shut down because of COVID who the heck knows there's the whole Russia mess I mean so we can talk about the short term and the long term so I don't know where you want to start, how you want it. But I'm just going to yield the floor to you. You can have at it. If you want me to throw questions at you, great. If you have a few opening comments you want to make, great. We've got, just so you know, it's the first time you're in, this, in our space. I'm just going to warn you, we've got a lot of smart people in this room who ask tons of great questions. So, uh, Arjun, the floor is yours. Thanks, George. And by the way, I, I love the spaces. I actually don't usually listen live. They are available. I, I don't know if people know on YouTube, and I listen on my favorite podcast app. And you've had so, so many great guests. It's an honor to be here. And You've actually had a lot of good energy guests as well over the last couple of months. Hopefully, I, I won't be repetitive, but but maybe just a few thoughts. And, and George, you know, we, we go back a long way. I, I just passed 
the 30 year mark this past uh, March of sort of being an energy equity research analyst. And the first 22, as you know, were kind of in those traditional Wall Street jobs, primarily at Goldman Sachs. And I, and I stopped in 2014 when I got burnt out in the DOR role and uh, took, took a step back, caught my kids in, in, in middle school and high school, which was a real blessing. And I've been in these sort of behind the scenes roles um, in various you know, boards and, and advisory positions. And I, I should say I'm here 100 percent on my own behalf and all my views are purely attributable to, to myself. But I, I kind of, you know, there's something about COVID and minus thirty seven dollar oil and probably most notably all the narrative around energy transition that kind of got me reengaged. And it started with Twitter. I made friends with Twitter and enjoyed sort of engaging with folks like yourself and former clients. Um, but there's only so much nuance you can have there. So I started my own Substack. Uh, it's arjunmurdy.substack.com. It's for free. Um, and and it, it is meant to be both a way to kind of get back into the swing of things, but it's also meant to be educational. And I think just my sort of utter dismay at how, whether it's politicians, policymakers, investors, and, and frankly, energy executives, both in tr the traditional space and the new, newer sectors, how they think about energy transition, I, I just think is just completely messed up, for, for lack of a better phrasing. And it doesn't mean my views are right, but I have spent 30 years looking at it. And so maybe I can add something to, to the discussion. And, you know, you, you can get frustrated with extremists on both sides. I'm for sure not a progressive. And I know this is definitely not a, a political um, spaces, thank goodness. Um, but there's plenty of stuff on the right I don't agree with either. And I, and I think when it comes to energy, where are the pragmatic solutions? And, and it really is kind of the combination of bad investment decisions by both companies and investors, and you have to start there, you know, made worse by bad policy choices uh, by politicians, especially in the Western world, that kind of has us where we are. You know, and so I, I do think we're in the early stages of a, a, pr a pretty good period for traditional energy, in part because everyone thinks we're transitioning. And so you're seeing, you know, insufficient capital flows, at least so far. You're seeing a perception that demand is going to go away. And for all the reasons that people hate energy, and there's some good reasons to hate traditional energy, that is in part what's creating this, this better background. You know, I think, George, in listening to your spaces, um, it's, it's not a straight line up. You know, so for the, you know, this sector is not immune from recession. You know, so I think there is some nuance involved. I, I, I prefer the language super vol environment rather than super cycle. If we're, if we're in an era where you don't have OPEC spare capacity and you have pretty low uh, below ground, above ground inventories and the CapEx cycle is sort of generally slowish to respond and companies are paying out dividends and stock buybacks, that's not an environment where you're going to get robust supply growth. But when you do not get robust supply growth, you will get demand destruction pricing. And that, that's a very tenuous thing. So as we saw last spring, you spike up to 120, 130, whatever it is, and it could be crude oil, it could be gasoline, it could be diesel another time, it could be natural gas in Europe. It's going to be different products and commodities over the next decade. But the opposite of demand destruction is a pretty painful economic period. And, and the energy sector is certainly not immune from that. So we can talk through this about all the prior analogies. Is this the tech bubble burst where energy significantly outperformed tech? Is it the 73, 74 recession, which was at the start of a major, major bull market, but energy did suffer in that downturn before it had a massive outperformance in the second half of the 70s. I think that super vol mindset is something I implore sort of investors and companies to think through. And if I could just kind of one final opening remark, so much time is spent counting barrels and trying to guess, are we going up or down in the commodity prices? Kind of my framework is, let's look at the capital allocation cycle, because in this business, it is very long term. And for me, that's the return on capital cycle driven by the capital spending cycle. So these cycles are 10 to 15 years up, 10 to 15 years down. And simplistically, 91 to 2006 up, 2006 to 2020, the most recent 15 year period down. And that is what everyone remembers. And that is sort of all the mantra, these companies destroy capital, sector stinks. Well, it was a 15 year downturn. So yeah, during that period, they stunk. And that is, that is why investors are saying, don't waste my money. Uh, give it all back to me in dividends. Don't have your stupid production growth forecasts. Um, and all of that is contributing to a new capital allocation cycle. 
So with energy, unlike, say, tech, uh, whether that's profitable tech or unprofitable tech, energy is never popular. People may tolerate it. People may invest from time to time, but it's never a popular sector. And every time it rallies, the question is, are we at peak? And of course, we're going to have pullbacks, especially we're going to have pullbacks if we're in a super vol environment where you have limited supply demand and you have to demand destroy, you have to destroy demand to, to rebalance markets. That is going to be a very volatile environment. But you can't say, is this a trading peak? Or is this a structural peak without knowing where you are in the capital allocation cycle? And I would argue we're in year two of what is likely to be, I don't know if it's a decade long, I don't know if it's longer than that uh, type upturn, but for sure, when do when do energy cycles end? They don't so, end at trough capex. Yeah, yeah. so, so, uh, so right? Arjun, so, so yeah. so, so hold on one second here. Let's just yeah. break this down. So I'm an energy tourist. Maybe a knowledgeable tourist, but I'm a tourist. I mean, I'll be the first to admit it. I know enough to, to ask you annoying questions. But if you just stand back and think about it, I mean, I learned from you and others over the decades that, you know, often the attention, as you rightly pointed out, um, is focused in the wrong place, namely the demand side. But it's it's the supply side, which which really drives cycles. And, it's a, and, and, and supply is relatively price inelastic in the short run. And so go back in the way back machine when you started your career, it was what, 20, 25 million barrels of excess uh, production capacity. We're going back, we'll go back to the yep. 80s and 90s. OK, so we're now down to whatever it's, you know, a million to a million zero, whatever it is. It's, it's almost all gone. And so given depletion, given the uh, carbon shame that's gone on, given how almost every energy executive had a near death experience in the last, in the last, um, uh, in the last few years. I mean, if you're an energy guy, it's like, okay, you know, we're, it, 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 it's Pavlovian response. It's like, okay, fine. I get it. So I don't put another hole in the ground. I buy back stock. I pay more dividends number go up and my stock price goes up. Okay. This is good. All right. Yeah. And then again, not to get into politics, but when you have the president, I mean, it's just unfreaking believable. The, the, the accusations are being leveled and the shaming and this, that, and everything else. I'm, I'm on a rant now. So, you know, like the supply ain't coming. So supply ain't coming. And the world doesn't go into depression. And maybe it does. That's that's one way out. Because the only way I, I see that oil prices really don't go up from here is if somehow demand gets reeled in, which, which will come through an economic recession. But if you take a big recession off the table, Explain to me, I'm going to channel my inner margin call, that great scene, you know, with Jeremy Irons, you know, explain to me how the oil price over the longer term doesn't go up a whole lot. Pretend I'm a golden retriever or a small child, Arjun. So I'm going to I'm going to agree with a lot of what you said, but not everything. So um, in, in a world where we do not have sufficient capex and you do not have spare capacity, which you correctly highlighted, and you do not have above ground inventories, you don't get to have robust economic growth. Um, and I don't, you know, um, we need the capital spending cycle to come back in a major way. Uh, and, and in fact, we are, you know, barely off the lows at this point in time, despite what has been a much better return on capital environment and a much better price environment. And so um, the idea, and so this is where I, I think the Super Bowls do have to be careful because both supply and demand are highly inelastic. You'll, you're going to have to keep this market in balance through regular recessions and regular periods of economic weakness. You do not get to demand something that doesn't exist. And you're 100% right, George. There's always been a pretty significant spare capacity cushion in the OPEC countries. Uh, and I thought that was somewhat overhyped in the 2002 to 2008 cycle. I thought it was more drawn down based on their actual actions. And I've always held countries to the standard at some point, you actually had to have produced it, right? So they would sometimes declare spare capacity well in excess of what they'd ever produced. Um, but now they don't even pretend that they have the spare capacity. Even countries like uh, Saudi will say it's, it's pretty, pretty minimal without more CapEx. And so if you do not have CapEx, if you don't have supply, you don't get to have demand, right? And th th this is the big thing I think people get wrong versus other sectors. If iPhones are sold out for whatever reason, what do you do? You wait till they're back in stock. And maybe that's three months, maybe that's six months, or maybe buy an Android phone. And that's true for every other product on earth. If it's not around, if, if BMWs are sold out or Teslas or whatever, um, you can wait or you can buy something else. That is not true of energy. If, if it does not exist, um, you cannot live without it. You can't live without it for five seconds. And those are, the, I think, the regular price spikes we're going to have. But the flip side of that is 
you would expect to have regular pullbacks in economic contraction because it's untenable to be in a sustained demand destruction world. So 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 if if you think about the logical fallacy here, the idea that you know we're going to have okay growth and oil prices, there'll be oil prices won't go to the moon and there'll be plenty of supply. Like I mean this that's just that's just logically inconsistent. You don't get to have that environment until you have capex at least double, if not triple, from oh, an industry-wide oh, 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 standpoint. Okay, okay, okay. Today. So, Arjun, one, yeah. one of the numbers I, I go nuts on, and actually, you should put this in one of your substacks. I'm going to tell you what to do, but whatever. I think it's a really great number. So, Arjun, just help me with this. What is total capex, energy capex in the U.S.? Is it like $100 billion or something like that? Do you know that number by chance? Yeah, I, uh, in fact, I wrote about it uh, just this weekend for like a universe of like 75, 80 companies. Uh, your CapEx is it's probably going to be pushing uh, 150, 200 billion dollars. That's both oil and gas. And I'm sorry, that's actually going to be a global number of oh, a universe of 80 oh, companies. So. OK, OK. Yeah. So globally, we'd say energy CapEx, maybe on the outside, it's 200 billion. That'd be the lion's share of it. Right. Yep. OK. OK. So what I like to do actually, he could probably call some of your ex-Goldman pals. They, 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 they will. Um, they will get that they can get you the numbers, but you should do a calculation. I've said this so many times, causing trouble in these spaces. I'd like to know compare that to the how many tens or hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars were spent on Tesla call options or daily SP options. I mean, you know, Arjun, think about it. Talk about misallocation of capital. We become a nation of speculators. I mean, what we need to do is have guys put more, more holes in the ground, you know, all types of extractive industries. So, coming back to your point though, like. If you're an energy executive, like I hear what you're saying, you're not going to get supply unless we get higher prices. But we'll put it this way. We need more supply. How are we going to get the supply without prices going to the moon? I mean, it's not rational for any energy executive to go out there and put another hole in the ground right now. I mean, they're, 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 they're sitting in the catbird seat, right? So, so walk me through different scenarios you could envision and how we're going to get to where we need to get to without a big disruption. So... So this is a sector that the returns on capital went from the mid 20s and the 2006s, which I would note 2006 was two years before the actual peak of 2008. So the capital cycle, spending cycle already started to overwhelm prices and returns as, as early as 2006. So the, that, that super spike era, as I called it, was 2002 to 2014. And 2014 is when it famously, famously crashed after Thanksgiving from 100 to 50. But the return on capital peak was actually 2006, and you had tripled, quadrupled CapEx uh, in terms of what we were doing in the late 90s, early 2000s to that middle of the decade type time frame. We are obviously far from that today, but we have the kind of returns on capital, mid 20% today, that would normally suggest a much more meaningful CapEx response. So why, you know, why aren't we having that? Um, and you know, that is that mixture of it hasn't been here long enough. If you, just, if you had 15 years of bad returns and the return on capital from 2011 to 2020 was 0%, George, zero. Now, maybe interest rates were zero and we had QE unlimited, but zero is a really low number. Yeah, RJ, um, hold on. So hold on. Yeah. Say that again slowly. Return was zero from when to when? 2011 to 2020 for a universe of oily EMPs, return on capital employed was zero. And keep in mind, the oil price average. 50 to 55 dollars a barrel that was the kind of price that they said at 50 to 55 dollars we can generate 30 50 100 percent rates of return in shale at the well level that translated they got the price environment they actually forecast that translated into a zero percent return on capital so we're on the other side of that now investors said hey you promised 30 50 100 percent rates of return at 50 dollar oil you delivered a zero percent return on capital. You are not going to waste my money this time around. And they they have also learned that lesson. So the, the time. So the, the question is not what price you have to go to. The, the question is really how long do returns have to stay at the 20 to 25 percent level that we're at today in, 20, in 2022 returns on capital are going to be 20 to 25 percent for this sector. How long do we have to stay up here to motivate a capital spending response? And it has started. Um, but it's the kind of thing that typically takes a decade plus to get going. Well, Arjun, we, let me so hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on, hold on. You know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And if we were in a, a, an environment, you know, by the way, I'm not giving a wise guy pushback. I just want you to reflect on how it could be different. Namely, um, 
George, George, I, I miss all the pushback from my Goldman days. That's something you don't get. Right, I didn't oh, get okay, it at the right, end right, of my right, Goldman right. career, so I, I welcome it. All right, all right, okay. All right, I'll be I'll be my usual yeah. difficult stuff. Okay, fine. So if I'm an energy CEO, like normally in the, when the, when the rules when the, when the rules of play of old olden days applied, you'd be like, yeah, any commodity guy when he's making, you know, good coin, of course they put a hole in the ground, they put up another paper mill, they put up another steel mill. That's what they do. That's their job. But Given the carbon shaming that's going on, I mean, you'd almost think that, you know, if Chevron or Exxon announced they're going to drill more holes in the ground, they'd have their headquarters might get firebombed by all the left wing crazy. So, given the political imperative, I mean, did I see, Archie, was there something today? Did something, was there a headline yesterday? France announced by 2030 they're going to get rid of all short hole flights. Did you see that? I did I mean, see that. Yeah. Th- this is, this is insanity. So, so, you know, the old rules of engagement don't apply. So if like, if you're a rational CEO, like, and you're enjoying your stock price going up and so on and so forth, like, why would you put another hole in the ground? Why would you just continue to disinvest and, and de-equitize? I mean, so for the first time in my 30 year career, and for the first time in probably 150 years since we first, you know, Standard Oil first started producing crude oil and natural gas, there, there is uncertainty on that demand outlook. Now, I think the demand outlook is not nearly as uncertain as the perception is. And I, I would, there definitely is carbon shaming. There definitely is, you know, ridiculous political rhetoric. I don't think that's actually the issue. Um, it, it, it's a problem that politicians use that rhetoric, but I don't think that is what's keeping capital from being invested. It's, it's regular investors, regular investors who have not had to thought about in, in energy for 10 or 15 years, who in the 10 years they did look at it, gener- you know, it earned a 0% return on capital, went from 12% of the S&P to 2% of the S&P. And everyone's telling them, hey, you know what? We're going to have electric vehicles. They're going to be great. California is going to be 100% EV by 2035. In Europe, some similar time frame or sooner. And the rest of the world will follow. Um, and we can you know, electrify everything to get rid of carbon. And we're going to do it all with solar and wind. That is the issue. And so we could spend a lot of time ranting and raving about politicians and the ESG virtue signaling. And I agree with all the critiques, but that's not actually the issue. It's a more fundamental issue that it's traditional investors and for that matter, traditional companies um, that are why this cycle is taking longer to play out. If people perceive, if investors, your former colleagues at the, the places you work, George, where I used to work, if they believe that oil demand could peak in some year or natural gas could peak because the world wants to decarbonize, then who's going to invest in that environment, right? And so that's, it, it, it is those people that need to be convinced. It's really not about politicians. It's so fun our, to so, blame so, them. So, so, so yeah. our, 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 let me interrupt, let me interrupt yeah. as I usually do. Let me ask you a question. So when yeah. you were at Goldman, or it doesn't really matter, you're going, just generally speaking, do, and, and you would be dealing with both the company managements and the big institutions. Um, would the company managers actually take to heart what the investor base would tell them? They don't have a ch- yes and no. They don't have a choice right now. Um, when you've been starved of capital, when you're two percent, so like what, one of my comments to companies and sort of the advisor roles I have is, you know, when you're two percent of the S and P as they were, the issue isn't is is X Y Z company better or worse than the other shale guy that you normally compete with. The question is, investors can totally skip you. Like you look at like the steel sector, the paper and forest product sector, who cares what those stocks do? Maybe as a hedge fund person, you can trade them. But from a broader relevance standpoint, no one cares. So, and that that is where we were at 2%. My opinion has been that when the sector gets back to 5%, which it's just that now, now you start getting portfolio managers starting to care again because of the tracking error. And then some of the truth about what is our outlook for demand? Is it really so possible to just switch from ICE vehicles to EV vehicles in some 10-year period or to somehow think you can magically run an entire grid that's based on dispatchable power, uh, somehow run it entirely on solar and wind? I'm not against solar and wind. It's just a question of can you have, forget about 100% mix, can you even have a 20% mix, right? And so that fundamental reality is hitting people in the head. And the issue is to resolve it. You don't resolve it in a year. You resolve it in decadal type timeframes, and you have to get going on it. So, 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 so Arjun, what you're, I totally agree with what you're saying. What you're describing, though, is, is an environment where it almost seems like a big dislocation or crisis is inevitable because this is just so poorly thought out. Like, it, you know, it's like no one's really thinking, yeah, there is no master plan. It's just individual economic actors all acting according to their own incentives. 
you know, as Charlie Munger would always famously say, you show me incentives, I'll show you the outcome. So, like, it just seems to me we're destined to have some type of big dislocation stroke car carriage. How would you how would you respond to that? I mean, I think we will continue to have demand destruction pricing come up every time we try and grow again. And I think I think that is going to be the challenge across the market. And so, you know, one of my takeaways, George, from listening to your spaces, which, again, I love, is that this idea, you know, we've been in such a QE unlimited zero interest rate, you know, nirvana kind of world. That is not the world we're in anymore. We're out of energy. The geopolitics of the world are changing. Inflation, you know, regimes are changing. Populations are changing. All globalization is changing. And so the idea that we're going to go back to what we were, I I subscribe to your view on that. Um, The idea that we can get back to some sort of um, hunky-dory growth, you're going to need energy. Um, you don't, you don't get to wish it out of the ground. You actually have to spend real capital. It often takes a decade. The, the, the super, the last super spike era, it started in 2002. People went after oil sands. They went after Arctic. They went after Russia. They went after deep water. It turned out to be shale oil, which didn't start till 2012. And then we were oversupplied by 2015 and it stunk for a decade, but it took a whole decade of capital spending to get there. And people tried a whole bunch of stuff. No one's trying anything today, right? There, there's signs that shale, I think shale can still grow, but there's signs it's maturing relative to where it was. Canada is, for some reasons, unacceptable. I think that's wrong. I think that's the number one thing that has to change. No one's trying deep water. Um, we need you know, production out of Latin America. We've got government issues there. We need a wide breadth of capital spending to return across the value chain, pipelines, natural gas, refineries, oil, and no one's doing anything. But it, it's only been one year of better returns. So, so uh, Arjun, yeah. so your so your your point is it's not even it's not so much that we need more higher price. We need time. Is that what you're saying? I think we need time more than anything. Um, and and I do, so I want to say a couple things. I think again, I don't agree with the political rhetoric in any way. I think they're completely out of their minds. But I also don't think it's a reason why capex hasn't responded. Um, I'm going to say the same thing for the ESG crowd. The virtue signaling part of it will drive you crazy. I don't see, I mean, there are elements of it that we clearly need governance as an example. These companies all had the exact same bad strategy last decade. So some diversity of thought is clearly needed amongst these companies. But the sort of all we should care about is climate, all we should care about is green versus brown. I don't think any of these labels are relevant, but that's not why spending hasn't started. It, it's, it's a fake argument, in my opinion. It has not started because the sector stunk for a decade. Investors said, I don't want to bother. And it's just taking time to come back. The only part of all that that I think is weighing on this sector is the fact that there is this mantra of we're going to decarbonize. And let's just say we want to. Let's say that is a good societal goal. I have no problems with that. The question is, what are you doing to decarbonize? And if all you're doing is saying, I'm going to ban ice vehicles in some year and we're only going to motivate solar and wind, I will say this, you will not be decarbonizing. That is not a decarbonization strategy. That is not a healthy economic environment strategy. We should be doing some of that stuff. But that is not actual fundamental energy policy to both have economic growth and decarbonize. And if you're picking choices, people will always pick economic growth and energy availability over these kind of, you know, pie in the sky type um, decarbonization dreams. So, 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 OK, so, Arjun, let's because um, we got some really smart cookies here I want to bring into the conversation who know more about energy than I do. Uh, the guy to your to just to your right marathon, he's a smart cookie. He can ask better questions than I can. So. In fact, I'm going to ask one question. I'm going to I'm going to bring him in to, to help cross examine you. So, Arjun, if you uh, let's talk just a little bit about the short run. Yeah. Um, a lot of cross currents. Um, you know, opinions like noses. Everybody has one. There's a cruder version of that, as you know. <laughs> but given the delta that's going on with China, um, you know, they have been running down demand already. His inventories, you know, have run down, so demand's been lower than it's been otherwise. So you could argue, you know, the delta from there's up, not down. A lot of talk about the Russian oil. It's going to go into the market anyway. It's just going to go through China and India, blah, 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 blah. But obviously, a lot of the keyboard monkeys that key off the, uh, the short-term price. And I know, you know, trying to trying to predict oil prices is a fool's errand. But if you were going on your road show, came up to Boston, you had to be, you know, people said, what do you think of the stocks? And you, of course, would have a handout showing the short-term question on oil as well. So talk just to, I mean, we've covered the long-term. Maybe just talk a little bit about the short-term and then, and then conclude with what you think for the stocks. And then I'm going to turn on to over to Marathon. Arjun? So um, the, the, the more confident one is in a, in a deeper global recession, that, 
that is not an environment that's ever good for any equity and oil equities are equities first and foremost, right? Then the question is, you know, what are the parallels one might look to? And so you look at something like the tech bubble burst, which there's clearly elements of today that feels like that, the unprofitable tech, the arcs and so forth. NASDAQ's down 77% from its peak to some date that I picked, energy was down 17%. So energy still fell on an absolute basis, but it did significantly outperform the market. If you look at the 73, 74 deep recession, again, there's a lot of this environment that feels like the 1970s. I was alive for it, but not as an active investor. I do remember waiting in the odd even license plate lines with my parents as an example. But energy did do poor. The energy went down with the market in that brutal 73, 74 recession before it really took off in 75. So for, for, for those of your listeners who are more in the deep recession is coming, um, then I think it's just a question of, how far does energy fall and is it, does it relatively outperform or does it go in line with the market? I, I, I don't agree with the viewpoints that somehow energy has significantly outperformed here and therefore it's going to underperform the broader market because energy is one of the constraints out there. And every time we try and grow again, um, I, I think we're going to be put up against um, you know, a new price up cycle. For, for those not in the deep recession camp, that, then to me, it's clearly a buy the dips type environment. So if S&P 4100 was a near term top, I'm sure we can pull back. Um, you know, we're in an environment where people are acting like energy is going away as a sector in five years. If you look at free cash yields, if you look at what kind of returns on capital you're discounting, people kind of believe that decarbonization is going to happen in a really short time frame. So whether you can have a view where you know for sure it is or isn't. Maybe someone can't have that confidence. They're discounting some notion that oil demand is going to permanently peak in, in the late 20s. And I, I will take the over on that at a minimum as a risk reward. Got it. Right. All right. So let me start with my inane questions. Uh, I'll come back. Don't worry. I'm, I'm not going away. I want to I want to I want to actually turn the floor over to Marathon. And Marathon, uh, good to see you. Um, Maybe you could take over the discussion, actually, because you're much more uh, knowledgeable. I think you, got, you probably know each other. So, Marathon, the floor is yours. Hey, George, thanks a lot. And look, there are a lot of smart people on this uh, on this call who are very uh, energy conversant. So, uh, but I'd love to ask a few questions. Arjun, great to, to catch up and just really appreciate the contribution you're making to uh, the energy dialogue out there. So much of it is, um, uh, let's just say, not grounded in fundamental uh, you know, uh, the supply demand or the realities of the physical constraints. Um, and so I just, I, you, you've done a really, really good job uh, of, of, of being a, a great contributor to that conversation. Thank you very much. And we, we do know each other. I don't know if you go by just the marathon name, but um, I do thank you. And I appreciate all your contributions as well. So. Okay, great stuff. So first question is, what do you think, where do you think we are in the trend for return on capital in the shale patch? We're kind of going through this Goldilocks period right now, where we've got high prices, relatively low service costs. You've got a lot of the drilled uncompleted wells that people have worked through. So return on capital has been very high. Where do you think it trends from here, given sort of quality of acreage decline and service costs probably on the margin picking up here? Where, where are we in that evolution? I mean, this is where I think, I mean, this is where I think um, investors are going to have to be company specific if that's what they want to do, right? So I, I look at things more at an XLE or broad sector level. And then, you know, obviously I talk to and deal with individual companies, but there's no doubt that shale acreage uh, is not homogenous. It never has been. I mean, frankly, that was one of the problems with the old paradigm of the well IRRs or 30, 50, 100 percent. But somehow they're only generating a zero percent corporate level return. There is much more heterogeneity to begin with. Um, and all the factors you mentioned were coming off a low on service costs and so forth. Um, you know, so I, I think a lot is going to 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 be differentiated at the company specific level. And I think when. So something like M&A is going to be inevitable for this sector. It is a depleting asset by nature. And so for every company, there is a, there's a constant need to add resource if you desire to be a going concern. Not everyone should be a going concern, but usually most companies try to be. I, I, I think that's one of the jobs investors are going to do. Not, not all these companies uh, clearly have the inventory running room to perpetuate what are competitive advantage returns, but some do. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to probably refrain from individual names here, but I think there's plenty of smart people and there's plenty of good services today that, that help differentiate that. I think the days of can you have a million barrels a day of shale supply growth 
like we had 2015, 16, 17 in that type of environment, those days do seem in the past. And there probably is some combination of spending and price that could technically get you back there. I think the idea that it would be sustainable, um, forget about whether investors would completely throw up on it or not. Um, I suspect those days are in the past. Now, the, the, the flip side is, it's not obvious we can have sustained economic growth in the absence of having global supply growth. And so, and so I think that becomes a, a, a trickier calculation. One of the pushbacks I get is sort of, hey, returns on capital are now 25%. Isn't that well above what these companies have historically done? And you would say in a commodity business like oil, over 50, 100 years, you would expect return on capital to about equal its cost of capital. And let's just call that 8 or 10%. It's not the 0% QE unlimited type environment. Um, but honestly, it's probably not much better than that either. But, but through that sort of structural cost of capital, return on capital equals cost of capital, you're going to have cycles. And those cycles are 10 to 15 years up, 10 to 15 years down. So it's not that I think 20 to 25% of return on capital is sustainable over 50 years. It's not. There's no way it is. It will attract capital. Investors love to make money. And that's why I think ultimately this isn't about ESG. It's about traditional investors coming back to the sector and recognizing you don't get to magically decarbonize just because some portion of the country thinks you can do it through fairy dust, right? And so how long do we stay here? Um, and, and I suspect we'll be in the 20% kind of returns on capital level you know, for the foreseeable future. Now, if you tell me there's a deep recession next year, including China and the United States, oil prices could fall on a short-term basis, return on capital could fall and the sector would expect it to be down. So what I try and look at is how are returns on capital trending relative to underlying oil prices? Are you doing better or worse than that? And for individual companies, it's gonna vary a lot. If you've done a bunch of quote, bolt-on deals that somehow are still multi-billion dollars, not sure when that became the bolt-on category, maybe that says something about your inventory quality, maybe it doesn't. So maybe as an individual company, you could be going off that line of sort of return on capital relative to a level of oil prices. But for the sector overall, when we're at trough capital spending and when we're at trough reinvestment rates, that points to the underlying return on capital trend relative to oil prices continuing to be in a favorable environment. And in my note this week, weekend, I said, you probably need to somewhere between two to two and a half X CapEx from where we are today before I think you'd start worrying that again, that underlying trend of return on capital relative to oil prices uh, starts, going, starts going against you. And, and so whether, what, is that three years away, five years away, 10 years away? It's at least one year away and probably more like five years away. I hope that's clear. Right. Abs absolutely and totally agree. I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to have Chapman uh, ask his question because he's got his hand up. Um, I, I think as you have mentioned, there are a lot of impediments to getting this capital flowing back into the sector. Um, and you've discussed sort of the, the, the variability of, of politics, which, you know, it's, one can debate how much that's had an impact over it. There certainly has been an impact from the decisions by pensions and endowments and sovereign wealth funds to sort of divest from these sectors. So companies aren't getting any equity, uh, public equity return. Uh, for growing. Um, and so, you know, I'm seeing that in some of the pensions and endowments that I'm talking to uh, who are saying that, you know, even if they did have a resource exposure that they held on to for the last 10 or 15 years, which a lot of them didn't, um, they're getting a lot of pressure from their boards, which are more political appointees than actual investment professionals, uh, to say we should own less, even though it's the only thing in their portfolio that, that's working this year. Um, but the one that I'm actually more concerned about, and I'd be curious as to your thoughts on it, the movement by things like some of the big insurance companies, et cetera, to stop underwriting uh, risk in some of these areas, Munich, Re, and some others have come out. So as you look at that sort of spectrum of impediments to spending capital, what's, what are the ones that are the most urgent and potentially the ones that need to be addressed sooner rather than later to make sure that uh, capital investment isn't choked off even more? I, I think your question really nailed the core issue here. So there's a lot of attention placed on the pressure on investors to, quote, not invest in fossil fuels or what they call dirty energy. And I personally disagree with the divestment movements. I think, you know, denying people energy when, as I know, you know, there's a billion people without any energy. There's three billion people who are energy poor. Denying them any form of energy is, frankly, completely immoral and effed up, if you ask me. But, but, but someone could still have a different view on that. And I do think 
investors will by and large come back to the sector because the profitability is going to be good <laughs> and, and the, the returns are there and capital spending is low and reinvestment rates are row, low. And so we're early in the capital allocation cycle for the sector. So I don't worry as much about traditional investors because traditional investors want to make money. And if their portfolios underperform because of under allocation to energy, they absolutely will come back. And it is a slow slog to go through the proxies, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there are so many different investors out there uh, that it's really hard to get them all to do one thing. That's a different story for the group you're talking about. What I would be most concerned about from an energy policy standpoint is there are only so many insurance and reinsurance companies out there. There's only so many major capital markets providers out there. And if you look at things like the Glasgow Alliance for Net Zero, I'm going to get the acronym wrong. There's some you know, mushy language in some of those documents that don't sound particularly bad. But when you see Munich Re decide to uh, stop reinsuring oil and gas fields starting, I want to say, in 2020, they're totally entitled to do that. They're a private company. And there may be many reasons why they do that. I'm not a reinsurance company analyst, and so others may have more insight. But if you read, the, if you take their statements at face value, including their press releases and the documents they refer to, they cite a decarbonization goal and a need to be, you know, Paris aligned and the Glasgow uh, Alliance for Net Zero as some of the reasons why they took that action. That is deeply disturbing. Um, we, we, if you're going to take away insurance, reinsurance, and capital markets providers, and we've not seen this spread to the big banks, but make no mistake, they're under tremendous pressure. It becomes a very slippery slope. Um, will the sector have enough internally generated cash flow to do all the stuff on their own? Probably. I mean, we're not looking for them to start taking on new debt and do other things, but you need insurance and you need reinsurance. And maybe the largest companies out there can, to varying degrees, figure out alternative actions or they may not need you know, all of the support from these markets, but that's not going to be true of mid and smaller size companies. It is a, it is a very, very troubling trend. Now, um, if, if, if this is an investment space as opposed to a policy space, and I'm pretty sure it is an investment space, then all these kind of actions are ultimately bullish for the sector, right? It's, a, it's what I will use, the Seinfeld analogy. It's a bizarro world sector. What's good is bad and what's bad is good. So people can hate on current politicians in the United States all they want. And I might agree with it or I might not agree with all of it. But all those policies that restrict, deny, divest traditional energy ultimately elongate the period of good returns on capital. Um, on the other hand, um, and in my roles, where I do sort of care about energy policy and I do deal with those kind of folks, I would be most concerned, not about the ESG investor crowd, but about the major reinsurance, insurance and capital markets providers and what happens to them. Munich Re is the first serious shot across the bow. Um, and I, I, think, I think for humanity's sake, people should be deeply concerned about that trend. We all need energy. Rich need energy, the middle class need energy, the poor need energy, and of course the super poor don't currently have energy. Uh, we, you can't have these major companies going away. That is a, that is a very unfortunate trend. Amen, brother. Amen. Thank you. Uh, all right. I'm going to go ahead and let Chapman uh, speak. Go ahead, Chapman. Unmute yourself, and uh, you have the floor. Uh, good evening. Uh, Arjun, your thoughts on demand destruction pricing, I think, was uh, fairly insightful in a way that I hadn't quite thought about it before. And my question to you is, do you think that some of this demand destruction pricing you know, that we're going through might be somewhat by design. Basically, our policy decisions by authorities, governments, whatever have you, being made around this idea that, hey, we're not going to need any more oil. So if it causes a little demand destruction when the price goes up to $100 and we have a little bit of a, a recession, so be it. So I, I, I do think there are some folks who would be in the camp that, hey, $300 oil, $200 oil, whatever high number you want to make up, um, yeah, everyone's going to complain about it, but at least it'll mean that. I mean, so th I, I honestly believe it's a very small minority of people that, th um, that fit that bucket. It, it may seem like a lot when we read the rhetoric of politicians, including in major parties and so forth. But I think the true number of people that are in this sort of degrowth environment, if you will, it, it is frankly quite small. I think the, the bigger challenge is, I think, being way too optimistic and how easy it's going to be to decarbonize through new technologies. And again, the failure of what I think are the, is the ideology around current technologies and thinking that's going to be suffice. Hey, 
If we're California and we ban ICE vehicles, then by God, everyone will simply drive an EV. Now, listen, I happen to drive an EV. I I've driven a, 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 an EV for the last seven years, and I love it. And I'm also a retired partner at Goldman Sachs. So I'm a very fortunate individual that I can charge at home and that I can afford the EV in the first place. That is definitely not everyone's position out there. Uh, you know, and, and so the idea that we have either supply chains or batteries or all these things, like so there's a whole bunch of magical thinking around decarbonization. Like what are the, you know, what are the things you're going to need? Uh, you, you'd actually need real fuel economy standards, not the fake ones that we've missed by 90 to 95 percent over the last 20 years, really since the 1970s. Uh, you, you, you're going to need um, you're going to need nuclear power as an example. You can need firm, reliable, dispatchable power as just two examples of things you might need. Uh, and, we, and I, you know, I could go on for a long time about that in terms of demand destruction pricing. I do want to make one other point. It's it's not a price. It's not one hundred and twenty dollars crude is the demand destruction price or 150 or 200 or any other number it is going to vary it's going to depend on the totality of all your conditions we did get to 120 this spring and it does seem like demand came off but that doesn't mean that is going to be the demand destruction price next time if the economic conditions are weaker maybe it happens at 90 or if economic conditions are stronger because china isn't shut down like they were last year i mean imagine that china's actually been sort of shut down if China's not shut down and India's still going, maybe it's a much higher number. And again, maybe it's diesel this go around. Maybe it's natural gas. European natural gas prices, I think many people appreciate, got to five to six hundred dollars a barrel. And guess what? <laughs> they destroyed demand. Who wants who wants to go to five hundred, six hundred dollars a barrel every time? That's what the European gas price got to. And now it looks like they have a decent chance to get through at least this winter. What's the price going to be next winter? Maybe it's lower, maybe it's higher, but it varies. You know, and so I think that super vol mindset is very important. And it's probably the biggest thing that I, I don't want to say I would push back against sort of the, the structural bulls, because I think we have a lot in common. We frankly have far more in common than not in common. But this concept of sort of extreme volatility is going to be here. And I get it that public equity investors do not like volatility. It's, it's not a question of liking it or not liking it. It simply is going to be. And it's going to impact every other sector. There is nothing we don't do without energy. It is, it is part of everything, and we all take it for granted, including most of Wall Street and including most energy analysts. And so, um, sorry for going on there, and hopefully, I sort of answered your question. So, so anyone else, uh, Chapman, do you have a follow up? Uh, not at this time, but uh, yeah, you 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 hit where I was going with, which was, uh, what do you think about the degrowth and? How are and where are they? I think so, degrowth is um, a disgusting, disgusting philosophy. You know, when when there's still so much of the world that does not have anywhere near what we have. But it, but I will say that I actually think that's a minority of people. I, I even even if we look at major political parties in the U.S., I, I I would not say major political parties are for degrowth. Even if sometimes we don't like the rhetoric or we think it's dumb or we think it's off base, I I, I don't you know. People may be misinformed about how easy transition is, but I'm, I'm going to be optimistic and say the true number of people in the degrowth category are relatively small, um, and maybe they just get more attention because of social media these days. That, that's my experience dealing in the policy circles. Great. It looks like we got a question from uh, Gnostic. Gnostic, you want to uh, take the floor, unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, nice to hear from you. Uh, I have a question for you. It sort of tags on to what you were just discussing off Chapman's question, and that's the economic dislocations that are becoming that are coming because of the decarbonization process and the expectations that if you're going to decarbonize, we're not going to do investments is causing oil companies to back away. But what other areas do you think these dislocations are going to occur in and what sort of distortions do you think will come about? It's, it's, it's actually a really, really great question. And we, we could probably do a multi-hour space on, on that. I mean, and frankly, it's, it's all facets of investment that are needed um, in, in all areas of energy and metals and mineral supply chains. Um, you know, and so it, it's, it's very, you know, well, um, you know, we, we need um, investment in, we can't, where are the places you can invest? Maybe we can start there, right? Canada should be at the top of everyone's list as a supposedly friendly country uh, that actually has a lot of oil that, by the way, has a carbon capture hub that'll 
um, take away all their scope one emissions disadvantage to other sources of crude and where they actually do pay a carbon price and where they're actually capable of generating good returns on capital. It's an example of where I would love to see more investment. It seems like their own federal government is as much of a bottleneck as is our government. Um, and, and they have the same history of the previous decade was more challenging. So we're going to build up to it. But Canada is an example of a place where I think more investment is needed. Clearly, global gas is going to be a huge area of investment. So f- first, let's just I'll try and be brief here because I don't want to be boring. But you have transportation markets, right? That is ultimately going to be crude oil driven products or miles per gallon or electric vehicles. And frankly, it's a mixture of all those things that are needed. The idea that you can have 100% EVs anytime soon does not exist without a whole bunch of supply chains and batteries and cost improvements. And even then, I think totally unclear how, you know, I live in, um, you know, again, I live in a nice house in a nice neighborhood. Have people been to India? Have people been to Africa? <laughs> Where are they going to charge? You got to be joking, right? And so, the, but that doesn't mean they need to follow in our SUV path. Uh, you know, we were driving around Scotland last summer. I drove 600 miles and drove an SUV that got 59 miles per gallon, 59, five, nine. And I think it had less pickup and the engine size was smaller. And there's probably other reasons that any automotive analyst could probably explain to me. That's not the experience with our SUVs here, right? So that's an example of a policy change we could do and would be more impactful um, than saying you're going to ban, you know, ICE vehicles by some year. You're going to need a whole bunch of copper, all the metals and mining, which I think is well known now, all these kinds. We're going to need a nuclear investment cycle. That that is going to be very long term, uh, given that we do not incentivize right now reliable power, right? When you think about the power mix, Originally, nuclear went out of favor in the middle of the last decade because of natural gas. If we treat power as sort of a marginal cost analysis, where there is no cost for the wind or the sun, or even natural gas prices can always be low, then that's not an environment where you're going to have lots of nuclear. And, and it, but if you want to decarbonize, then you're going to have to figure out how to change it. I, I am not a power markets expert. That is for a different analyst of, in a different spaces. But I just simply make the point that it is overwhelming what we need to do. That doesn't mean it can't be done. We, we've, provide, we've, the, we've had miraculous economic growth over 100 years. We have the most people living on earth now. We are the most prosperous we've ever been because of energy. And it's all forms of energy, but obviously historically it's been crude oil and natural gas. The, I do think people are starting to recognize, I've heard it including as recently as this afternoon, the idea that you only only want to do solar and wind is ridiculous, right? And so even people who you might think are left of center or this or that or whatever label you want to put on them, I, I do think there's a growing record. And then the question is, how do you motivate nuclear? And, and, and you may not be able to, or it may be very challenging. That's the role for natural gas then, right? So nat- and we need to clean up methane and natural gas. I support cleaning up methane. That is something I think environmentalists are 100% correct on. And I think you can do it with a reasonable cost and reasonable technology. So natural gas will be part of the mix. So we, we need lots of everything. And you have to start at some point. But I want to be clear. We will invest in this stuff. The world will not tolerate being without energy. It's, so my call is not. It is up and to the right for the rest of the time. That was never my call at Goldman. It is not my call now. My call is that you have to get the capital spending cycle going to think that you're going to peak. And then as it progresses, let's see how it's going. Let's see if returns on capital are starting to fall off the trend line relative to a given level of oil prices. That's when I start to worry. I don't worry if next year oil prices are down because of recession and returns on capital fall sequentially. That may be a trading opportunity to buy the dip, but the structural cycle will end when we have double, triple, quadruple CapEx and we're far from that today. And you don't do it in a year. You usually do it in a decadal kind of time frame. That's great. Gnostic, did you have a follow up to that? I thought I saw your hand pop up again. Yeah, I, I was sort of going to address the time question in here. Um, from my experience, the less time you're given to do some sort of structural adjustment like this, the more extreme the volatility and the more you tend to overdo it on the upside and cause a crash on the other side, which only delays the overall development of the direction that you want to go under regulation. Uh, So my sort of question is, are we going to get into that over exuberance 
uh, on the upside when we get closer. As regulations push this further and further, my concern is we start to overdo it. And on the over and understanding, I'm a trader. I mean, so from one side, I see the over overdoing. I'm going to participate and move forward and and profit from it. On the other hand, I feel guilty when I look around and I see all these people that you know don't aren't able to sit down and do that. And I see a horrible financial distortion coming uh, that just makes me scratch my head. I'll participate if, if that's how it happens. But I'm just wondering, do you see that, that degree of distortion coming that's going to be so extreme that you get like just, just that huge crash afterwards? There's, there's, two, there's a bunch of different ways to answer that question. So one of the, one of the artificial timeframes out there right now is that we need to urgently decarbonize in such a short period of time frame, even though it's completely unrealistic, which, again, doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying to decarbonize. It's just a question of the time frames are, you know, um, this idea that we need to do a whole bunch of stuff by 20, 30, 40, 50 or, quote, the world is going to end. And I think whether the world is going to end or not, um, the idea that you're going to replace your, your existing infrastructure in 10 or 20 or 30 or, excuse me, 50 or 100 years is a complete pipe dream. So to the extent you're not going to do that, then you can actually need to invest in it and figure out what is a reasonable path to uh, effect um, a more sensible transition that doesn't cause the world to be impoverished. So it's one time question element to, to answer your question. A different one is, will we overdo it? A absolutely. <laughs> These things always get overdone. That, that's that it happens in every sector on Wall Street, right? It, it happens with tech, um, it happens with energy, uh, it happens with biotech. There's not a sector that happened with the financial sector as we saw in 06, 07. So, if you're asking, are we going to overdo it at some point in energy? Absolutely, we're going to overdo it. I'd be shocked if we didn't. Um, I would just simply argue that we're at the beginning of trying to get it going in the first place. And so, the fact that it merely outperformed in one year after having, after having again, in part, deservedly gotten crushed for 15 years, I don't think is anywhere near, quote, overdoing it, even if we can trade off in the event of a recession next year. And so, listen, it's a commodity business. What, what, what I think, so one of the things I always hear is energy is a sector that destroys capital, always destroys capital. Always is not true. It destroys capital half the time, and it makes a ton of money the other half of the time. And when you average out those two halves of time, you get a return on capital that about approximates cost of capital, which makes sense. It's a capital intensive business. Oil fields naturally decline. And so you have to constantly spend money. If you, who's going to provide this money if you're always destroying capital? So clearly there are times that attract capital back to the business. The point is that it's deeply cyclical and your amplitudes are extreme. They're extreme on the downside and they're extreme on the upside. It is not one year of 20% returns that is overdoing it. Now, could it be five years or 10 years? That's that's probably the time frame to look at. Could it be 15 years because people are so psychotic on the policy side? I suppose, but the bad policies will not persist because people will not tolerate, rightfully so, not having energy supply. No one is, I know my children can't tolerate the internet being out for five minutes. Again, there's a billion people who don't have that luxury, um, but for the, you know, the, the, the daily active users for energy is 5 billion. There are 8 billion people on Earth. Your daily active users are 5 billion. Those 5 billion can't look at Europe, right? The, 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 the greenest place on Earth. What are they burning? Lignite coal in Germany, right? So, so the, the, the place that is supposedly most committed to decarbonization is burning the dirtiest form of coal. How, you know, what, why is that, right? And, and so that, and that's true. So we will overdo it. We're, we're so far at the other extreme right now that that's not a concern at this moment for me. So, 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 so Arjun, you know, I'm listening to you. On the one hand, at one point I was like, oh, wait a minute. This sounds really good. You're like, we need more time. It's not price. We need time. That yeah. we, need the, we, need, we need this sort of profitability to last for a few more years. So I'm thinking, okay, well, if it's not a flash in the pan, and then maybe people will start to give these companies more credit in terms of the valuation or multiple. But then in the next breath, you're like, oh, we're going to get volatility. And that's like, that goes the other way. So when you think about energy stocks, I mean, what does that mean? I mean, to me, the equities look, you know, very cheap. Um, but you're buffeted about. On the one hand, you've got the long-term bullish case. Um, and, 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 and the valuations don't reflect that structural profitability. But on the other hand, you have all the tourists who are like, oh, my God, the price is going to go down. Yeah, oh, it is true. It is true. If we get a recession, you know, all things being equal, which they never are. It's not good for oil prices. So when you when you put that in the blender and shake it all up, like 
where does it what does it leave you leave you with, with, with the stocks you put it another way you know if if you were if i came to you and said here arjun here here's a hundred dollars please invest it um you're the energy guy you know would you want to be just partially invested or you know i you think you're going to get a better better entry point once the short-term volatility goes out the way is everyone's holding their breath to see if we have a recession or not or would you put a little bit in just because the long term they're so attractive or like how would you th- how do you think about investing in this sector right now if you were actually for and i asked the question now not to put you on the hot spot but for the average investor in the room i mean we have a lot of energy um uh, fans in the room uh, you've probably heard from some of our past spaces there there's a and by the way i'm gonna i'm gonna lobby um uh i see abe is in here and, and some of the other characters I'm going to lobby for you to be inducted into the Canadian uh, Canadian oil mafia. They'll probably start you at uh, at private lieutenant or something like that. But you know, there are a lot of energy fans in this room, and so wh- what does that leave you thinking? How does that leave you thinking about the energy stocks, or is it really a question of multiple time frames? Well, first of all, I did do a spaces with the Canadian oil mafia. I, I love them, and I do have my I love Canadian energy mug sitting right. Oh, behind I, I so didn't I'm, know that. Oh, I'm well, very well, pro. Well, I'm well. American, but I'm very, very pro Canada. I think it's a terrific country. So, George, it does not surprise me at all that your question that you started out with completely gets right and nails the heart of the issue. We are in the early stage of what I think is let's just call it a decadal like time frame of on average. Big word there on average excellent returns on capital as we are in the above normal portion of the cycle before some point, I don't know if it's the 2030s, 2040s, sometime in the future, we go to a below normal portion of the cycle. However, there's no one should delude themselves into thinking it's going to be smooth. And that is something that is different than the, the super spike era. Super spike era was an environment where China joined the, and I know you know this, George, China joined the WTO uh, emerging market growth surprise to the upside. And remember going to that time frame. People's view was in the 1970s, OPEC withheld oil. Um, we had deep recession. It was terrible. So anytime oil goes up to in 30 nominal, that was the view. Um, we're going to have a deep recession. And people's opinion was if oil ever got to 50, and remember oil was 15 to 20 throughout the 1990s, that the only way we go to 50 if Saudi was destroyed. And we, we did a bunch of work at Goldman and our original super spike call was, hey, from 1981 to 2000, energy underperformed the economy for 20 years. And so to really have the same kind of impact, you had to go to at least 50 to maybe as high as $105 a barrel. That was my original super spike call. But that environment was smoother. It was smoother on the capital side. In that environment, every company, including the super majors, Texaco, Mobile, uh, Elf Accutane, Total, Shell, uh, all of them, they all had at least 3% and in most cases, 5% growth objectives, production per year, and all the and all the EMPs had even higher numbers. And we did the, our top 50 projects report at Goldman. First year, we forecast 4%, it came in at zero. Next year, we again forecast 4%, and it again came at zero. We made, it was Nigerian disruptions one year. And it, we finally said, hey, wait a minute, something's changing on the supply side. It's not as easy. We got to go through a capital spending cycle. And China joining the WTO, where there's insulation to price movements, uh, demand is going to surprise to the upside even as oil goes up. And that was the core of that call. None of those conditions exist today. No one is trying to grow. Maybe there's a company that for like one year has three or four percent growth. No one is competing on the double digit growth. All the majors have sort of non-disclosed production growth objectives, which I, I mean that positively. Right. So like we're not trying to grow production. We're trying to crank up our variable dividend and, and all this kind of stuff. No one's trying to grow, but nor do we have China joining the WTO and that type of environment. We have perhaps India at some point replacing China as China's population ages and the one child policy comes home to roost and all the challenges that you know, you've talked about in other spaces comes true. Um, yes, they're gonna come out of lockdown and that's probably good for 2023. So for the traders on the call, there's some call there, but I, I'm not counting on China to have the kind of structural growth like they had in the 2000s, but nor do we have either the OPEC spare capacity or the attempted supply growth that people tried last time. So it's a different environment for, than, than that cycle. And again, the idea that we're not, I don't think people should be hoping for some, smooth, some future smoother time. And so, you know, George, I, I don't charge for my sub stack. I do generate some income from my various advisory and board roles. And again, I'm not speaking in any relation to any of that tonight. But when it comes to my personal investments, I do look at it like we're not in the Q- QE period anymore. 
Um, we're not in the, you know, in the period where I want to own a whole bunch of unprofitable tech companies. And we had a Goldman reunion uh, last week with my, my former colleagues who used to work on my team. And I, I had ARC going down to $27 from and a year ago was 97. And that's thanks to you, George. So you helped me with my GS reunion stock pick. It's at 36 right now. So I, I got closest, uh, closest to the mark there. But the, the idea that we're going back to the, that environment, I don't think so. Um, you know, and so a decade for, uh, you know, 2030, will I look back and say, I'm glad it kind of bought and held energy? Yes. But not everyone has that viewpoint. I'm judged by my children and my wife, right? I'm not, I'm not judged. I don't manage a public portfolio or anything like that. And I think people should expect volatility and figure out how they want to deal with it. It could be by the dips. It could, you had a, a person on here a couple months ago. I think Michael Belkin was in there. He had a terrific short call, I think, in May or June. I do think that was a trading call. Uh, and that was a good trading call at the, at the time. It stacked your fell quite. And so people want to do that. They can do that. Not my thing. Again, I'm, I'm sort of, as a person now, um, more in the sort of how do you think about energy policy? What should companies do long term kind of world? For my personal investments, I don't own, to my knowledge, any unprofitable tech or for that matter, even profitable tech. And I do think things like energy are going to do well over a decade. But other I, people are going to be much better at trading it, including yourself. So. I, 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 Arjun, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. And foolishly, I somehow think that I have a good handle on the short run. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. Um, let's keep it moving here. This is fantastic, Arjun. I don't know how much time you, you more you can spend with us. But uh, I want to go over to uh, Rob. You had a question. R. Jacka Praro. Uh, please unmute yourself. Rob, the floor is yours. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. good. Go, yeah, go ahead. You yep. talked about uh, certain constraints coming into the business, whether they be from uh, capital markets. But I've also picked up on things like, uh, I believe it's Valeris CEO has spoke about the, uh, you know, uh, the, the yards that won't commit to building new rigs possibly for drilling offshore, uh, along with, you know, uh, cycles breed their own echoes over investment breeds, despair and under investment breeds. Uh, the opposite of that, between skilled workforce availability, between, again, the, they could show up, the, the majors could show up with big checks. How much of a limiting factor is that to reach the capex that's going to be needed just to maintain or even grow production? Uh, it, it's, it's another excellent question. I think it all speaks to the idea that none of this stuff is resolvable in some short one or two year time frame. We can always have pullbacks due to recessions or what have you, 100%. But the idea that you're going to fundamentally, the idea that you could like triple CapEx next year to get back into what in my note last week we called the danger zone of CapEx. I mean, you know, if it's even five years, that's pretty optimistic. You have to go through the capital spending cycle, which is why what I started with is these cycles tend to be 10 to 15 years up, 10 to 15 years down. I don't think this is the China joining the WTO environment like the 2000s, so it will be much choppier in part because of the very issues you're raising, which is we're out of all sorts of spare capacity and includes workers and includes skilled workers. All of that is solvable. It takes some time. It takes some money. It takes some people wanting to do this. I, I, you know, again, we uh, Marathon asked earlier about the Munich Re decision, which I've also written about, which I'm, again, de deeply disturbed that someone would do that. Um, I, I think if we were in an environment where shipyards or oil service companies or whomever said we don't want to fund you know support fossil fuel investment you know then i think we're talking something different but again i don't think there's going to be a, a population-based tolerance for not having energy and this is 80 percent of our primary energy and it's going to be for a long long time and so it will take time to get workers come back this is an industry that has laid off workers for the past 15 years and so my guess is they it will take more time to come back. They're probably going to have to pay higher wages. All those kind of things are, again, part of the normal cycle. But um, the idea that we can't ever do it, I, you know, I, I don't agree with that. I, I, or not that you were suggesting that, but I think some people do. We absolutely will have a capital spending cycle in this sector. And that's just the nature of how these things play out. Right. So, so that, 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 that's a terrific question and a great answer, Arjun. Arjun, I got a smart qu question from a smart uh, member of the audience. Um, He's asked well, two questions. Uh, one his, one's mine. Um, how could how 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 could um, how do you think peace negotiations with Russia um, might impact your views? Let's assume peace broke out. And then the other question, which is really a long ball question, and I think I know the answer. I'm going to ask it anyway. There was the announcement the other day about I think it was Chevron being given permission to like you know go into 
Venezuela or whatever. And obviously it's not going to move the needle anytime soon because it's a tiny amount of oil. But when you think about the future, because again, the title room is a future of energy investing. Um, maybe, you know, and, and I don't know if the Venezuelan bonds are doing better lately, but, you know, could you see Venezuela entering the fray again sometime in the future down the road? So I think, I think there's been a lot of, I think a lot of people have gotten what's going to happen to Russia's production really wrong. And I'm not suggesting I've been some great visionary on it, but again, I'm, I'm also not quite fighting the counting the barrels on a short-term basis battle that is out there. So for example, um, I'll get my years right. I guess it was this past spring uh, when Russia, Ukraine first happened, the IA was forecasting Russian production was down 3 million barrels a day. It ended up being down a little less than a million barrels a day, and maybe not even that much as the production was rerouted from Europe to China and India and so forth. And so my, my, my personal view on Russian oil production has always been the issue is long term. It's not actually short term. In a market where you have tight supply demand balances, so long as that is true, whatever they can produce is going to get to market. And you know we've seen that in the past. We saw that with Iraq um, back in the 2000s under oil for food. There were supposedly sanctions and limitations, but that oil also made it to market. Uh, maybe it was at a discount, but it made it to market. I think the issue with Russia is really if it's a pariah state, what is their ability to sustain production over the long term? So people, when we can get right into Venezuela, Venezuela in the 1990s under Luis Justi, head of PDVSA, went from one and a half to 3.2 million barrels a day. Then when Chavez took over and nationalized and destroyed PDVSA and all the people who were good left the company and left the country for that matter, production fell from 3.2 million to ultimately as low as six or 700,000 barrels a day. That's what happens when you, um, sorry, go socialist and then destroy your oil company. And I, Russia is not on track to do that, but they could well be on track to be a prior state, ir irrespective of whether there is peace, which hopefully there will be, uh, or, or not. If you want to ask me my trading opinion of tomorrow, it's announced that there's a ceasefire. I'm sure on those kind of days, I would expect the sector to trade off. I think the question is, does it change anything about where we are in the capital allocation cycle? And that it does not. Would it change anything about Russia? Most likely being a pariah state. And therefore, I think you'd question whether they can get back on track to what had been a kind of 1% growth objective or, or, or reality. And, and maybe they're now in a minus 1% structural kind of supply decline. I mean, that, that, that would be my expectation for Russia long term, that uh, it'll be difficult for them to maintain their oil fields and they were probably maturing anyway. I, I think the area that needs to come back to help supply the world is actually Latin America. It is where you have massive resources. The, the, the Venezuelan heavy oil, it is the greatest heavy oil in the world. By my recollection, it cold flows several thousand barrels a day, which means unlike Canada, which I love Canada, as you know, but Canada, you have to heat up the oil to get it to flow. You don't have to do that in Venezuela. And that oil is completely um, excellent for the Gulf Coast refineries. That was the deal. They produced the oil and we refine it in, in the Gulf Coast. So we're still set up to do that. You, you almost certainly are going to need a different government. You're almost certainly going to need much more foreign help than you did back then. Uh, you might recall that, you know, in the early 2000s, all the oil companies were nationalized. Chevron's the one that stayed. So there's still a whole bunch of process to, to go through there. So I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. But Venezuela, and, and for that matter, you throw Brazil and Argentina to the same bucket. They'd be in the category of, I wish they had different governments because they have a lot of good energy resource that the world really needs. And with better governments, their people would benefit from it. So sorry if that sounds too sappy. No, but, that no, no, um, that, 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 that's that is what is needed. I just don't think it's a short term thing. So that's great. Let's go over to Storm. Hey, Storm, good to see you. Got a question for Arjun. Please unmute yourself, Storm. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much, Mr. Noble. Great space. I just wanted to hear about 2020. Your thoughts on it. Do you think we'll ever see oil, that kind of mishap, what occurred? I know there was accommodation of things, but I just want to hear what your thoughts on it. Thanks so much, Mr. Noble. Uh, you know, I, I think it highlights the inelasticity of, of oil supply and demand, and it does work in both directions. You know, and so uh, w when you get oversupplied, you, you can, you know, we would have historically said, and, and like our work in 08, 09, people may not remember it or, or but whatever, was that when once we went into the great financial crisis, 
we were then trying to figure out what is your production shut in price. And we thought that was, you know, $30 a barrel or $20 a barrel. I think we briefly touched there. Typically, you don't stay there long. What was clearly unique about 2020 is normally recessionary environments are like you lose a million barrels a day demand, maybe a million and a half, and maybe for a quarter, three months. Here, we lost upwards of 20 million barrels a day as the world shut down. Now, if, if you want to be optimistic, you can say horrific pandemic, the world stopped and we only lost 20 million barrels a day. Now, 20 million barrels a day is 20x what we historically would have lost. Um, and I think that explains negative $37 oil along with what we're obviously, um, uh, you know, a de facto retail account that for some reason didn't understand physical delivery and roles and all that. I mean, there's a huge technical, an actual but ultimately technical reason for why that happened. So I, I would think it's probably not repeatable. But can you have oil prices crash to production? Of course you can. I mean, there, there's never a call that it's only up and to the right. I mean, even at Goldman, whatever people thought about our calls, we never had the world running out of oil. We never thought it was a permanent upcycle. I'm going to sound defensive now, probably. I think our normalized price got as high as $100 a barrel, and it was generally about $70 to $75 environment. We've always tried to call the cycle. Sometimes we've done a better job of that, and definitely sometimes I've made lots of mistakes and done a worse job of it. Um, but 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 is it is a cyclical sector. So can you can you have extreme dislocations? Absolutely. It's a physical business. It's not an anticipatory business. You have to resolve supply and demand every single day. I, my, my, my former colleague and friend, Jeff Curry, makes that point very well. It's a physical business has to clear today. When you have one barrel too much, it's a really low price. When you have one barrel too little, it's a really high price. And we're in the latter environment right now. When you resolve that imbalance, you can correct pretty hard. And that's, that's my Super Bowl paradigm. Again, I think returns on Cowboy really good. Returns of capital can be really good over this decade, but it's a super vol mindset that I certainly encourage companies I interact with to have and to not fall into this lull that it's going to be some smooth path and just sunshine and roses. So, Marathon, over to you, Marathon. Hey, Arjun, I just wanted to follow up on your comment. Oh, you're so on Marathon, these. we can't hear you. I can hear him, George. Oh, yeah, okay. As long as you can hear him, that's all that counts. Keep going. Okay. Great. So I wanted to riff on your mention of the Latin American oil companies, that great piece that you put out on your Substack, the video, you know, that showed all the U.S. company earnings and the market caps, uh, relatively speaking, and showing, you know, Exxon having very high earnings and a very low market cap. That's m even more true for the Latin American majors. Uh, you know, most of these guys, you talk about a Petrobras or an Echo Patrol understanding that there are political concerns that are part of life in those parts of the world. Uh, but those are a couple of companies trading at, you know, two to three times earnings um, with, you know, well into double digit dividend yields. So I understand some of that because of the gravitational pull of the strong dollar and people leaving kind of non U S assets. Um, but I won't ask you to pick an individual stocks because I know you used to do that very well, but you prefer not to do that uh, any, anymore. But in general, the genre of kind of buying Latin American majors with low valuations and probably better growth, growth prospects. What do you what do you think about that? So I, I, I definitely well, first of all, thank you very much. But I, I, I like the genre of figuring out what besides the Permian Basin is going to be good. Every, and I like the Permian Basin. I, I like companies that have running room in the Permian Basin that are going to be able to sustain some mixture of advantage costs and, and profitability versus others. But it's very well known. And so therefore, there, there is analysis to be done on who has running room and who doesn't. That's probably true of all the shale plays. It's really what in rest of world is going to come in the money. Um, and I, I do think Latin America is is screaming to come back. My challenge, and I'm, I am distanced from it today, is to really know where they are in the political cycle. And so, you know, ironically, Lula's back. <laughs> Petrobras had some, had, some good, had some good times and had some bad times under, under Lula. And I, I did directly cover it for a period of time. Um, you know, Petrobras is a world-class company, so certainly capable of generating good profitability. But you know, that's probably the one that jumps out. But whether it's Colombia, whether in Echo Patrol or whether it's Argentina, again, I, I don't think I am close enough at this point to know uh, where, where they are in their political cycle, which is really probably as important as any other consideration trying to figure out these companies. But does the world need that oil and gas? Absolutely, it does. And is there an opportunity? 
in an environment where it seems like the Canadian federal government does not want to be supportive of its own companies for whatever reason, that then, then if it's not going to come from Canada, it's going to be, maybe that is an area. You know, that, Venezuela is, a, is the country just makes you cry because it is the greatest heavy oil resource in the world. It should come out. It should be partnered with the U.S., but that's going to take a whole bunch of different changes. Um, I think the Middle East um, is clearly an area where I think it's hard for outside investors to get exposure. Um, so I would suspect uh, United Arab Emirates, Qatar and Saudi will all have investment plans. And I will note um, people might laugh at this. I, I actually think they'll be competitive on having low carbon barrels, actually. Uh, and we can debate how we monitor that. We can debate what they do to prove that up. But that is why things like the Permian, I think, need to get rid of flaring. I, I, I think there is going to be a need to compete on low carbon barrels. And, and I, will, I will say that the Middle East countries will actually do that very well. Do we go back to deep water exploration? We seem far from it. Uh, but that would probably be the other area where, again, unlike these other areas where Latin America, you need to believe in politics. The Middle East, you need a partnership with an existing NOC, which usually is only going to be companies, not investors. So then the question is deep water. What is the opportunity for that? And again, I think that's an area that it will come back, whether it comes back in 2023, I don't know, but you're going to have to get oil and gas from somewhere. Again, the, 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 the region I would be most excited about, if unencumbered, would be Canada. Um, right now, U.S. and Canada are supply and demand about balance, as, if you add up the two. Um, I think with some combination of investors wanting to support investment, but as importantly, infrastructure being supported. And infrastructure is a critical issue for Canada, as I think everyone appreciates. I actually think you can get to 10 million barrels a day of net exports within 10 years. That, that by the way, would about happen to match um, recent Russian and Iranian oil production. So I don't mean to be offensive to anyone who supports those countries. I, I, I do sort of take a global view. I, I may not support them. Other people may support them. But, but, but if there is some notion of geopolitics, if there is some notion of good barrels and bad barrels, and if I do speak as an American, um, I don't know why we wouldn't have a policy where U.S. and Canadian oil supply and demand didn't allow exports to displace Russia and Iran and provide oil for our allies around the world. Um, That's so. great. Th thanks, Sergeant. All right. So we got an order here. We've got three people who are on stage who haven't asked questions yet. We're going to go first to 90s Random Consultant and then Ahmed and then Pietor. 90s Random Consultant, good to see you. Please unmute yourself. Thanks, George. Thank you so much. One of the things I think he's correct when he talks about Venezuela, but the one thing I'm very curious about is the timeline that that's even possible. And number two, if he has any insight on the assets, because one of the problems that, that people that I think people don't understand about Venezuela is their upgraders are what made their oil great. And that was some of the last shipments that they actually sit to the Gulf Coast were very bad due to the fact that the upgraders were fucked up. And so my question is, if they don't have the assets, how, how long is that that timeline not only to drill the oil, but also to upgrade it? Thank you again. Um, th thank you for your question. It's a great question. So, again, I'll try and do this quickly. If you go back to when Venezuela was nationalized in the 1970s and they took over um, the, the, you know, the various Exxon and Mobil and other companies, PDVSA, Petróleos de Venezuela, maintained a lot of those same employees, right? They, they were a terrific national oil company, one of the best for most of the early part of my career, which would have been, I, I was a child when it was nationalized in the 70s, but in the, in the 80s and 90s, it was a well-run state-owned oil company. You know, and so when the politics aligned to kind of motivate external partnerships, they were partnerships. Um, we had the refining capacity. We had the ability to take that upgraded oil, which you correctly highlight was a key element of, of, uh, of, of enabling Venezuelan production, and then processing it, processing it in, um, I'm going to blank on the names right now, but the Valero and the mobile plants uh, in, in, in the U.S. Gulf Coast. Um, but you were set up with a well-run state company with executives who were legacy from the super majors prior to nationalization and had been functioning in a good role, and then a government that supported, the contract terms were excellent. This is, this is something President Chavez was not excited about, but off the top of my head, royalty rates were somewhere between one and 16%, and it was pre or post payout. The marginal tax rate, I believe, was like 33%. It, I'm, I'm getting old, and this was early in my career, but very favorable fiscal terms and, great, and, and, and just really set to go. None of that exists today, right? The Pedevese has been destroyed. Um, it's been 20 years of neglect, um, but our, our starting point is lower. So if you told me tomorrow 
huge change in government, most Western friendliest government in the world. For some reason, we believed it. Um, whenever you have neglected oil fields and gas fields, yes, they take work. So I wouldn't think we would get back to 3 million barrels a day easy, easily, but it's been so neglected that I, I think people can be surprised if you can put real CapEx dollars to work. I'm not suggesting there isn't a lot of work to do as you're correctly highlighting, um, but that's what you call low hanging fruit in this business. Hey, we haven't had basic investment here, so let's bring it so you can bring it back. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a long time to get back to, say, 3 million barrels a day. But, but you, you can, you know, I, I would never underestimate the ability for engineers and this industry to get things to recover if allowed to. And again, the if allowed to is the big, the big caveat. So have I, I've not personally been down there in, in 20 years. So I, I do not underestimate how dilapidated things probably are. But again, and I, I asked that question because I've seen, I, I've actually seen their last shipments that came to the, the Houston area and it was trash. So I'm just saying people are already gun shy. Someone's going to have to prove that those reserves are upgraded properly before someone runs it through their distillation towers this time. But no, thank you very much for the info. Yep, thank hey, you. Hey, no, he's always, always glad to hear from you. All right, let's do Ahmed and then Pietro. Ahmed, floor is yours. Please unmute yourself, Ahmed. Uh, thanks, George. Um, hi, Arjun. Uh, pleasure. Um, my question to you is uh, uh, fairly global, I guess you would say. I've been seeing co conflicting data uh, with uh, the ex-USA supply and demand. Um, the, there was a, the IEA, uh, like up through late September, was showing um, a total liquids onshore storage way, way down this, uh, below the five-year average, you know, implying that, uh, that that supply is really lagging. And uh, more recently, uh, just a couple of weeks, uh, a week ago, from Jody Data, uh, uh, looking at uh, 54 countries, and uh, they're showing um, uh, compared to 2019, demand is up, production's down and lagging, and uh, crude product stocks are down almost half a billion dollars. Uh, I don't know what 54 countries are, but uh, I was wondering if you have an idea as to, to explain um, how uh, oil uh, has been pricing recently, if indeed this is true, or if um, this could be false data as far as uh, global supply and demand. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you for your question. So I, I will say there are definitely going to be other people out there who are counting the barrels better than I am, some of whom are for free on Substack. And I, I, I will refer to my colleagues, at, my, excuse me, my former colleagues at Goldman and some of the other banks who do an excellent job of, of counting the barrels. I, I guess I, I would say a couple things, though. W when you have a world where there has where even OPEC will admit they don't really have spare capacity, um, you can you can only draw down inventories so much. Um, and that was in part part of the price reaction we had earlier this year. Before you start taking out demand, you, you, you cannot sustain the extremes of this business of either having a glut of oil supply that fills up. You know, again, it's not like gold or copper where you can, you know, pile these things to the moon in someone's backyard if you wanted to. You have to have a physical tank, a terminal, a refinery or something to store oil, again, in the oversupply scenario. On the other side of things, when, when things get depleted, th there is a limit to it before you start taking demand out of the system. So we've clearly seen the contango and the curve go out. Now, now again, whether that's trading noise, whether that's short-term blips, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I do think other people will, will have a much better view than I will. It, it is no longer what I spend as much time on. Uh, I will, uh, you know, our line has always been that the truth is in the slope of the forward curve in the short term. So I think you can't just dismiss the weakening as purely technical noise. I think you have to wonder, is that a recession signal or otherwise? And I don't, I don't dismiss any of that. I, I, I can't only take the bullish interpretations of these things and say, well, when it goes against me, you know, it's noise, but when it supports me, hey, it's fundamental tightness. I, I think we, I think we, again, our line at Goldman was always the truth is in the forward curve, at least in terms of your kind of, your spot supply demand. So I take very seriously the fact that the contango has gone out of the curve and um, I'm definitely not smart enough. It's not quite my interest level to decide that we're gonna have a short-term recession that takes X amount of oil out of the market and, and therefore this contango is right or not right. Or this, you have this slight contango we have. So I'm sorry for not having a better answer, but I, I do think there are probably others who do a really good job counting the short-term barrels, and, and frankly, including many of my former hedge fund clients. And when I hear them talk about it, I think, I think they're on top of it, so more so than I am. Yeah, there are uh, uh, like the crack spreads are kind of saying the same thing. They're kind of shrinking. 
uh, especially uh, out in Asia. But uh, thanks for your comments, man. Thank you. Great. I think we're going to uh, Payad. Payad, go ahead and uh, unmute it, yourself. It's Piotr, Marathon. Piotr. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Arjun, great comments. Appreciate your time. Uh, I push back a little bit on Russia being prior because I think if you look at the partial embargo uh, from the Europeans, I mean, that's evidence to suggest that they still have to require, you know, retain some dependency on Russian oil and energy, just even if there's a war. So uh, I appreciate your thoughts on that. But my other two questions, which I'm interested in, the one, you mentioned Latin America and Venezuela, which I still think is a bit of a political risk. But what about Guyana? Uh, they've seen as a huge potential source of, you know, uh, oil reserves since 2015 and has seen their GDP growth by, I read one article the other day saying about 180%. So I'd be interested in your thoughts because they're just across the road and much more stable. Uh, and then the other region is Africa. Uh, we've got the potential for this trans-Saharan pipeline from Nigeria and Algeria. Uh, and I was just curious, uh, you know, what your thoughts are on any prospect of Africa being a region for potential uh, energy sources. Thank you. Yeah. And, and thank you for your question. And I, I actually appreciate the opportunity to clarify a little bit on Russia, because I think the, the, the way the Russian oil industry is set up is different than a lot of other countries. And it, it's for the better in terms of uh, their potentials to supply oil and gas to the world. So, you know, one of the challenges with uh, when, you know, my, the super majors were partnered in Nigeria is every year the, the Nigerian Congress had to allocate money to NNPC, Nash, uh, Nigerian National Petroleum Company, to get CapEx spent. And it was just a, a, a ridiculous process. And then you look at like Mexico, where Pemex and the government don't have lots of lines of differentiation, right? So some large portion of Pemex's revenues goes towards funding the Mexican government, which therefore doesn't allow so much free cash flow or, or you know, to go into CapEx. The countries that have done a better job uh, where they're state owned has been when there's at least been more of a notional separation. And that has largely been true in a country like Brazil, where Petrobras, I mean, it's a publicly traded company. There's no doubt there's significant government influence that frankly got worse uh, in the 2010s. But there's a little bit of a cycle there. But there's been a little bit of a differentiation. And that is especially true in Russia. So there you've had as many as sometimes half a dozen in, you know, quote, independent companies. And again, no illusions here. Um, what, you know, their leader will ask them to do or tell them to do, they're going to do. But there is they are at least notionally independent companies, uh, self-funded, if you will, which doesn't mean their cash flows don't go towards paying taxes. It doesn't mean President Putin or anyone before or after him can't tell them cut production, raise production. They may do all of that, but there is a distinction there. Even the oil services industry, as best as I understand it, that operated in Russia, if Schlumberger was there, if Baker Hughes was there, or Halliburton was there, um, frankly, it was Baker Hughes, Russia, Schlumberger, Russia, Halliburton, Russia. So when those countries decide after the Ukraine invasion, to evacuate or abandon or leave, um, they frankly just got turned over to, to, to Russian ownership, uh, it, right? So again, the ability for Russia to perpetuate, you make an excellent point, and I appreciate the opportunity to clarify, is much better than I think is commonly perceived or would be the case if you looked at different countries going through this. Um, the, the thing though is, is that's not unlimited. So my more bearish view on Russian production, I wanna, I wanna be clear when I say bearish view, Instead of growing 1% a year, which is what they've grown, and it is what the world has come to depend on, even in what has been a lackluster global oil, oil uh, excuse me, global economic environment, in a lackluster global economic environment, 70% of world supply over the last decade was from U.S. shale, uh, Canada contributed, and Russia contributed, and then again, a little bit from some of the OPEC countries. The Russia piece of that is going away, and the Permian and shale piece does look more mature. And so we're going to, you know, I, there, I've never made a call and I'm not making it now that we're running out of oil. We are not. There's plenty of resources, but you actually have to be able to invest in it. You have to be able to have pipelines come out of Canada. You have to have different governments that enable and incentivize investment in, in Latin America or Russia or Africa or wherever the case may be. And so I suspect or my view would be that Russia is going to grow, go from what had been a 1% supply contribution to the world to at best flat and probably decline. There, there are people who analyze Russia and say those fields were already maturing and they did need Western technology and investment to do next generation fields. Again, we can debate some of that and that's probably for a different spaces than, than this one. 
But I, my view would be that Russia will not grow going forward, and it probably declines 1% a year. So again, I appreciate that. I, I think the biggest area for opportunity besides Latin America would be Africa. But, but that's where some of the, this is probably one area where some of these policy, climate, virtue signaling, decarbonization policies have frankly been most disturbing, right? The, 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 the fact that some of the major, major institutions of the world are saying we are not going to support natural gas development in, in Africa because we want them to go directly to renewables is, is insane. Um, it, is, it is morally insane. It's financially insane. I, I don't understand how anyone can have that type of mentality. Some people do. It's fine. Um, and so the, the, the question is, um, how do we motivate investment in Africa? There is a lot of resource there, natural gas and oil. I don't see how there's any question that those people don't deserve to have the kind of economic developments we have. They may have challenging governments that could be stopping stuff. And in some cases, it could be our governments, meaning the Western world, that is stopping some of this investment from happening. So I would like to see Africa have more self-development. That is a, in my policy hat, that is something I care about. And as we talked about Munich Re, it is deeply disturbing to see the World Bank as an example and other institutions like that say, no, they don't get to have natural gas pipelines in Africa. That, that, how can that be okay? Right. And, and so I think, how do we motivate African investment? That's, right. that's going to be one of the big questions. But to, to, thanks, Arjun. Let, let's keep it moving. We've got a lot of other people who want to get some questions here. Arjun, how are you set on time, by the way? You've been more so generous. I don't want to keep you here all night. I, I'm doing okay, George. Okay, it's it's great. a lot of fun to be with you. So. Okay, yeah, Arjun, you know something funny? These rooms, like, I'll be honest with you, like people, when I talk to professionals uh, in the in the business, and I tell them, you know, I don't really read street, street research anymore. And I said, the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is look at my Twitter feed because I follow smart guys like yourself. I mean, honestly, Arjun, I find these conversations – far more interesting and in some cases informative than the sort of, you know, the usual, we'll, 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 we'll keep it anonymous, but the sort of, I'm sure you've had your more than your fair share of uh, institutional presentations you had to make over the decade. We, we just want to fall asleep. I mean, it's like, well, someone please ask an interesting question. You know what I'm talking about. George, I wish we had all these resources when we were younger in our careers, right? Oh, we were more dependent seriously. on the institutional paradigm and seriously. thank but, goodness but, but, for yeah, but Arjun, actually, you know what? I'm not going to butter you up, but it's people like you which really make this platform so powerful. I mean, I think the, the, the street is so ripe for disintermediation. Um, it's it, 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 they're just cruising for a bruising, and it, it really takes I mean, smart cookies like yourself coming out here. I mean, people know there's another way. They're tired of listening to bulge racket firms. Um, they don't want to listen to CNBC, Jim Cramer, all the rest, and you know, there's a collective intelligence out there. It's an extraordinary community. And, and, you know, I'm just the ringleader. I got the Rolodex. I know everybody. But, I mean, I learned so much from these rooms, not just from smart guys like yourself, but the questions are phenomenal. I mean, so it's really something. The community we've built here is really very, very special. And I, I, I like you said, I wish we had this 30 years ago. Um, so, in the hours, before we go to the next question, I had one for you. To what extent, I mean, it's, 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 you know, my grandfather used to say, never ask a question or you know the answer to. To what extent are companies... Um, are they or will they be constrained from increasing their production because of lack of uh, resources? I'm not talking so much about capital. That's the obvious one. But whether it's getting, you know, steel pipes or enough graduates from the Colorado School of Mines or, you know, you hear stories, a lot of stories from the Canadian Royal Mafia. Guys kind of, you know, they left the oil patch. You know, they, they got laid off. Now they want to be hired back. And people are saying, the hell with that. Forget about, forget about the carbon shame. It's just like, who wants that job? They love you. They hate you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it all sums up to a question, like how hard would it be in terms of having necessary resources to be able to increase the production if the oil companies wanted to? I mean, again, it, I, I'm sorry to keep giving the same answers, but it's, it is just a question of time. So, again, I've been doing this for 30 years and over my and, and there have been two deep downturns that, at the start of my career, uh, you know, and then um, just after the uh, super spike era. And every time it is the same perspective that, hey, the industry's graying, uh, no one wants to do this job anymore, and they're not going to come back. And they, they, they will come back. Um, investors will come back. Capital will come back. Companies may need to do a better job trying to find additional resources, but if they can't find them organically, then they'll get after them inorganically through M&A. And so I, I'm going to say most of it is just the normal cycle, if you will. And again, at, at this point, I don't even really blame 
um, Western world governments or ESG folks for holding this back. It's just it's just the nature of it. It might take a little longer. But again, if you're in a world where energy is constrained and where every engineer no longer is getting great stock options at hot tech companies, I'm not suggesting those engineers are going to go directly to the oil industry, um, but there, there will be graduates who want to come here. And I think these companies also have to kind of change how they present themselves at times. You are solving a critical need for human beings. It's a very insulated industry. And I'll try and keep this rant short. But there, I mean, it, at least in the U.S., most companies are in Texas and Oklahoma. Um, it's a pretty introverted petroleum engineering type culture, which I have huge respect for. But there is a need to be out there and to tell your story. And maybe it's not going to be the existing companies that are going to do that. But you do have to make yourself somewhat appealing. Um, and, and so um, you are you, you the world critically needs what these companies do. It is part of the solution to re eliminating remaining poverty in the world, to enabling a more prosperous world. And they're going to have to start telling that story. They cannot live in their bubble. So that's where something like ESG and it's going to sound silly, but diversity makes a difference. Who are they appealing to? Do they only have people from a couple states? How do they how do they get people from? Why wouldn't you want to go work at an oil company? Look at something like safety. If you look at safety statistics on a Hollywood movie set in an Amazon warehouse or the Permian Basin, you'd rather work for some of the leading oil companies than you would for Amazon Arjun, um, or, or a Hollywood movie set. Ar Ar Arjun, I couldn't right. agree with you more. By the way, Arjun, you need to rebrand yourself. You have an image problem. Uh, I'm trying to wind you up. You, you you have to tell people that you're actually a growth investor. Yeah, you are a growth investor. These companies are going to have growth in production. All right, this is this is where growth is. All right, you're not a value investor. You're a growth investor. Just get with the program. So, so George, part, part of my note was that we we will know energy is at peak when it's at 12 percent of Russell growth, like it was in 2011. It, it, I, I, I will say that this shouldn't be a growth sector. I, hey, Ar Arjun, Arjun, yeah. Arjun, 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 I think I'm a little older than you. How, how old are you? I'm um, 53. Okay. So I'm a little older. I'm 65. I came yeah. to this business in 81. All right. And they gave, Fidelity always hired uh, two kids a year, one from Harvard, one from Wharton. And they gave the other guy, the Harvard guy, they gave him the junior oils because that was a hot sector. I got stuck with non-ferrous metals, all right? But at that time, energy was, I think it was 25% of the S&P or some crazy number like that. So, yes. I mean, it's just we've come full circle, truly. All right, let's move on here quickly. So uh, I want to do this in the following order. Pietro with a quick follow-up, then Gnostic with a quick follow-up, and then Dave. Pietro, please unmute yourself. Yeah, so my follow-up was about what you said um, in Eurasia, Arjun. Um you know, what about the role of shale gas? Um, we, Europe has greater basins than the Americans do, but largely there's, a, you know, a, a big regulatory restriction and the Europeans are more just, you know, anti that sort of thing. So what about the potential for shale gas being explored around certain areas of Europe as a way to alleviate the energy crisis? So I've been generally skeptical that shale would get developed in the rest of the world, not because the resource isn't attractive. It can be in many locations. You mentioned parts of Europe. This is true for... Uh, Argentina and a number of different places, you just don't have the totality of of, uh, of things that, that go into it, which is in many cases, private land ownership, where there's a motivation to lease out the land. If, if people don't own the land and government owns the land and, you, and the people themselves don't benefit from the profits of that, then they're going to say, I don't want the drilling in my backyard. I don't get any of the profits, but I get all the activity and, and pollution and all that kind of stuff. So I don't I really don't even blame people for not wanting it. So you're going to have to fundamentally change the nature of land ownership. When, when, when people were going into a good example was China. So let, let me try this a different way. If the United States oil industry was entirely owned by ExxonMobil U.S. oil company, let's say they were our national oil company, it was just ExxonMobil, our shell production today would be zero. It wouldn't even be a single barrel a day because they would have never done it in the first place. It is, this is where people can get upset with independent producers, that they try and grow too much and they waste capital, but they take risk. It is a risk-taking culture in America. It's a capitalist culture. And the, and the landowners can get rich and the companies get rich and they can get poor because they get too excited and drill too much. But it's through all of that that we develop shale. And we do have some great shale reservoirs, but so do other countries, but they do not have the totality of our system. And so the idea that 
Exxon and Shell. We're going to partner with PetroChina and crack the code in China. That was never going to happen. So it's, again, it's not that I'm a, not a believer in the, the only country that, frankly, I think has done an OK job, maybe Australia and out of and to counter my comments that has been mostly larger companies there. But they also have more of an independence culture in Australia, uh, it, it, you know, and, 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 and it's a mining country and all that kind of stuff. So they had more of the elements of what went into it. So, again, I don't think it's a lack of resource, but I'd be pretty shocked if shale specifically, where you have to really experiment and drill lots of different wells, is going to get going anywhere else in the world. I, I would rather be wrong on that. But you're going to have to fundamentally change the nature of these countries. And that's not maybe that does happen. But. That, that takes a really, really long. Venezuela is more likely to get a good government and actually restart those oil fields than is Europe going to develop its shale gas industry, um, would be my opinion. Wow. Thanks for that, Arjun. Okay, Gnostic, with a quick follow-up, then we go to Dave. Gnostic, please unmute yourself. Oh, I've got a follow-up, but just when somebody, when you were talking about oil, shale someplace else, I just had this horrible picture of the fracking compressors and water supply that we've dealt with trying to make it across the ocean into another country to sit down and do it with a 3000 horsepower engine. And I, I just, I, I just cracked up. I'm going, those, those fracking operators would not get on a boat. It's, uh, <laughs> that I just, I just broke up thinking of the, just, just trying to get them over a hill was bad enough trying to get them on a, on a freighter to another country. is just, Oh Lord. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, is Guyana has a nice offshore oil uh, that should match the, the Venezuelan and, and should be interesting. So does Suriname. So that's going to be interesting offshore drilling. But the, the biggest one that hasn't been addressed yet uh, in, in any of this, and I, I leave it up to you whether you want to answer or not, is uh, state interference. U.S. state has interfered with investments in oil in multiple countries by denying investments, uh, independent investments to go into those countries. Um Sudan being one, Iraq, Iran, or pardon me, Sudan, uh, yeah, Sudan, Iran, uh, a number of other places have basically been denied uh, investment. Iran, I can understand. Uh, South Sudan still have issues with, um, but they've actually allowed, disallowed investments in these countries uh, to sit down and try and, and do anything, which has made it almost impossible to sit down and get to their oil. And you've got captured oil in Chad that can't make it past borders right now. So there's lots of oil floating around. It's just state keeps slapping people on the wrists. Gnostic, was there a question there? My question is, how do we get around the, the political interference of sitting down and, and trying to get supplies in? And that creates a political risk in other countries for whatever is the current regime within the U.S. for sitting down and doing things. Is there any way to get around that? Uh, you know, so... Uh, it's, it's a little bit like sort of how can we not have volatility? We're, we're going to have volatility. So pretending we're not doesn't do anyone any good. And that's going to be true of political interference. That's true of, you know, we, we have political inter interference in trying to get Canadian oil down to the United States, which completely baffles me, but, but it exists, right? We've got political interference in the North Sea where they are jacking up windfall profits taxes after sort of discouraging investment for a long time. So the political interference is widespread, including, ironically enough, <laughs> within some of the countries themselves. You know, it, it's just the nature of being an analyst and an investor. I don't, I don't, um, I don't want to say it doesn't make a difference because it does. I think when one is investing in energy equities or thinking about supply demand balances, that is part of it. The politics and the policies are part of it. Uh, and, and there are many reasons we do these policies. So I, they may not always be for wrong reasons. They may be for good reasons. Uh, if a country harbors terrorism, as an example, it seems perfectly reasonable to say to our companies, hey, they harbor terrorism, don't invest there. And maybe that's an American moral judgment. So like, you know, you know, so I, I don't think one can blanket say we need to lift all, all of this interference. I would like to see Canadian oil make its way to the U.S. That seems like a pretty no brainer kind of thing to do. Um, but, I, you know, th even that we don't happen. So I don't um, but, but nor do I think we will never have over oil oversupply again because of political interference. We, we absolutely will. And we'll have it because people will not tolerate not having energy. And so we're going to have an energy cycle here. This is just a question of how long. And, and we started with this and we could keep coming back to it. Is it three years, five years or 10 years? I'm personally in the it's probably going to take longer time frame because people have this ideology of decarbonization, which I support. 
I just don't support the ideology of it that somehow you can only going to do it with electric vehicles in some short time frame and renewables, which doesn't even make sense for any normally functioning grid. So the, the, the how people are going about it is the problem. And that is contributing to what will be a longer cycle. Um, but oh, we will so, we will absolutely have a cycle. So so so, so, so Arjun, the Canadian Oil Mafia didn't put me up to this, but um, and, and and obviously again there will be volatility. I get that. Yeah. But when you say it's it's going to be a long up cycle, I mean, isn't that music to the ears of an energy investor? You're talking about the visibility of the cycle because you know how it is. What you don't want is a one hit wonder. You know, it's like you know steel company sells on two times earnings. Earnings are here today, gone tomorrow, right? But you're telling me this is a long-term up cycle with a lot of volatility around I get it, but it just tells me the terminal value is much higher, no? And I think that's probably the other area that we haven't talked about yet. So if you have companies that where capital spending is much closer to trough than to peak and reinvestment rates are much closer to trough than to peak, and we're just starting to try and talk about where might we might want to invest and not want to invest, this perception that, again, oil demand is on track to peak in 2025 or 2028 or 2030, um, it's probably the biggest disconnect, right? And it's contributing to what I will call a, a de facto zero terminal value. Now, someone can say, listen, that's not zero terminal value. This year is peak earnings because of the Russian invasion. And at some point, that'll go away. And this is just a temporary blip like we had in 2015 uh, that bounced back in the spring and I'm going to get my years wrong, but 2017 we had a bunch of blips along the way. And I think, again, I'll say, I think 20, 2006 to 2020 was a 15 year downturn uh, for returns on capital. And now we're at the start of 10 to 15 years of upturns in returns on capital. Um, and that that's the core thing. It, it, that's the time frame by which I put parameters around this. Um, and it will be very, very choppy and volatile along the way. That's um, terrific. Yeah. All right, let, let's try to wrap this room up here. We got a bunch of que- bunch of people in the queue, so I'm gonna. I, I ask everyone who asked a question to please try to keep it brief. No, uh, no, 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 no speeches or filibusters allowed. Otherwise, otherwise the gong show is going to start. So let's go to Dave, and then after Dave, we're going to go to the Crude Chronicles. Dave, please unmute yourself. Hey, thanks, George, and thanks, Arjun, for taking my questions. Uh, just very quickly, Arjun, you, met, you outlined a, kind of a vision of, of Canada growing to around 10 million p- barrels per day of exports. I, I just want to confirm your where you see that coming from. I, I'm assuming you're talking about greenfield oil sands expansion as opposed to, to brownfield or offshore Newfoundland and places like that. So maybe just a quick confirmation on where you see the growth from Canada coming uh, in the long cycle. And second question is around, um, also tied to Canada. So last decade or so, the you know, U.S. producers uh, beat a hasty retreat from Canada um, and, and left the oil sands. Do you see that trend reversing? Do you see American ENPs or perhaps international companies looking at Canada for long life uh, reserves and perhaps doing some M&A north of the border? Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you for your question. Again, another opportunity to clarify. So 10 million barrels a day of exports would be f- from a combination of Canada, United States supply, 3 million out of Canada, 5 million out of the U.S., and then 2 million barrels a day of demand hit through stricter fuel economy regulations. The last piece, the 2 million barrels a day of fuel economy regulation driven, that requires bipartisan efforts that we have not seen over Republican, Democrat, any mixture of those two that you want to see. Um, So you might call into question whether we have the will as a country to really, this is the one thing I think Europe does a good job of, is, is, is they, they and Japan have had kind of been the two countries with some sort of real fuel economy gains over the years. We should know evidence of wanting to do that. But that would be part of it. I think for the 5 million barrels a day out of the U.S., I think some folks on this call would say, hey, are you sure you can get that out of some combination of the Permian and other shale plays in the Gulf of Mexico? And so even that piece of it probably has more questions today. Now, that's over 10 years. Um, and I do think we can get that kind of growth. I think as, if oil prices are high, you will see more tier three and tier two acreage become either tier one and a half or tier two. And the tolerance from investors usually does grow as the cycle progresses. You go from deep value investors to value investors, to GARP investors, to growth investors. We're far from that today. Um, but it's not like it was low cost projects that got the bulk of the investment last cycle. And it probably won't be this cycle as well, even if it feels that like that is the demand today. It may not be the demand in the future if people become more optimistic on the sector. So I do think 
U.S. supply, probably some help from deep water, over a decade can grow 5 million barrels a day. I think there are probably people on this call who are more bearish on shale resource who would say, I'm going to take the under on that part of the forecast. So then the last piece is Canada. 3 million barrels a day of export growth over 10 years would be a doubling of the growth rate. In Canada, it would be more choppy. It cannot happen without real pipeline expansion, which does require, A, the federal government of Canada to support it, B, the U.S. government to not stand in the way, and then C, and probably most importantly for companies to actually fund that growth. The industry has, I mean, first of all, the Canadian oils are very competitive on return on capital and profitability. Even the ones that I think are a little bit out of a favor today, I'll keep them nameless, but any Canadian person knows who they are. I mean, they've generally been competitive, let alone the ones that are doing a little bit better today. Um, will we see U.S. EMPs come back in a major way? Maybe not. There's not a great track record of too many U.S. companies doing a really good job up there. They're kind of few and far between. It probably will have to be the Canadian companies themselves getting the job done. And I do think they need their government to not stand in the way of it. I do think things like their carbon capture hub is a critical element to ensuring Canadian barrels are actually competitive on carbon. And on a long term basis, they People don't believe it. They are competitive on cost. Look at a return on capital for CNQ, Suncor, Sonovus over long periods of time. It is not different than the leading U.S. companies. And in many cases, it's better. Um, and it's long lived oil. So unlike shale, where it depletes very quickly, this oil lasts for 20, 25, 30 years, which is a great, great thing. I think Canada is really the key to ultimately moving to a healthier energy evolution era, but we're far from it. But thank you for your question. Hopefully that gets the pieces on the export potential yeah, better. better yeah, yeah, and Arjun, I think you're going to be uh, the crowds calling for you to be nominated as the uh, the head of the Canadian oil mafia. It's like, <laughs> like, if I didn't know any better, they put you up to this. All right. All right. We got a couple more. We're going to call it a night. So let's go to uh, Crude Chronicles and then we got Chaos. Crew Chronicles, please unmute yourself. Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. All good. All right. First off, uh, I'll reiterate, George, thanks so much for the spaces over the past year or so. Um, really appreciate it. Um, but Arjun, uh, good to talk to you again, man. And um, I guess my question is, I've been doing some sort of study, as you know, on, you know, looking at these cycles and uh, more so on like a well productivity um, at a company wide level. And what I sort of notice is like, you know, before 73, 74, you saw well productivity sort of decline. Then you obviously, you know, had those events in the CapEx cycle. And then. Sorry about that, Arjun. I don't know what happened. Twitter is Twitter is weird. We're almost at the end. You, you, by the way, I want to thank you. This has been extraordinary. And Arjun, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I've certainly learned a lot. And always great questions from this crowd. I mean, it really is something. I, I, I hope you've enjoyed it, Arjun. George, a lot of credit to you. I do listen to a bunch of different things. I, I, you, you're not cutting me off enough, so I'm going to critique you for not cutting me off enough. But I like <laughs> how you keep these spaces going and don't let questions get repeated. And it is a, it is a, appreciated as a listener to not just this space but well, other spaces. Well, well, so. no, th thank you for that. I mean, listen, I can't please everybody, but I do get a lot of compliments from uh, the crowd the way I moderate. I tell people this is not a democracy. Uh, I'm a sort of, I believe, I view myself as sort of benevolent dictator. I mean, we had someone come in the other day, perfectly nice guy, and, and I wasn't nasty to him, but he comes in and he asks a question, which he goes, oh, I just joined the room. And he literally asked a question which had been answered five minutes ago. And I cut him off in the middle. I said, I said I'm sorry. I'm not going to have it. In respect to the 800 people listening in this room, I, it's not fair to waste their time. I know. And, I thought um, that was great. I don't think that you are kind enough to publish these on YouTube. And if you don't like YouTube, you can just search for it on any podcast app. So I, I listen to all of your spaces, almost none of them live, almost all of them on Overcast, which is the app I use. And I love them. So um, people yeah, don't by, realize by, they can well, re-listen to what they might have missed. Well, so. well thank, thank you for your kind words. By the way, I mean, we do YouTube, Apple, and Spotify, as you point out. What is Overcast? I don't know that one. Is that a, is it's that, just, is, a, it's what, just what, a podcast app I, I like the fact that it does uh smart um it'll it'll eliminate all the blank pauses and spaces uh and just has some yeah. other controls to it it's just one of these podcast player apps all right so. that's cool all right we were almost done i i can't remember all right so you guys got to help crude, me crude, crude conicles yeah yeah, 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 so, yeah so crude, crude, crude conicles talking got cut off and then and then we're going to do chaos crude conicles please, please start again i'm sorry yep uh can you guys hear me 
All good. Yeah, we got you. All right, I'll take the cutoff as a sign to keep my question shorter. But um, <laughs> so, Arjun, I, I was looking, you know, through some past cycle data, as you know, and sort of finding some similarities with, you know, possibly like well productivity uh, at a company-wide level, you know, maybe sort of peaky-ish or just not growing like it has been the last couple of years. Just, you know, would like to hear your intake or your take on that and because the way I'm thinking is maybe that sort of kicks off a little bit of the CapEx cycle. Thanks again, Matt. I'm sorry, just so I understand, you're saying that the well productivity is peaking or starting to pick back up. I might have missed that part. So It's not growing as fast as it was, say, the past five years. So I guess you could say peaky-ish. Peaky-ish. Yeah, I mean, I think that is feeding into the concerns. And first of all, if I hope everyone does subscribe to your Substack, the Crude Chronicles. You know, I, f- I feel shame that as a Goldman analyst who's been doing this for, or a former Goldman analyst who's been doing this for for thirty years, my data generally only goes back to like nineteen seventy, and in some cases it's nineteen eighty or nineteen ninety. Uh, Crude Chronicles has pulled the uh, whatever they call ten Ks in the late nineteen early nineteen hundreds and done work back over a hundred years. It is some phenomenal histories on all these companies. I would encourage everyone to subscribe to uh, to the Crude Chronicles Substack. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's still for free and it's it's outstanding. I, I think your your question though is getting into this question of sort of the maturity of of shale in particular, which has again been seventy percent of supply growth over the last decade. Um, I, I would say it's too early in this capex cycle to know. Um, it kind of makes sense that we drew down the duck inventories, the drill but uncompleted wells, and had this sort of false sense that production growth would be easy. Production growth is never easy. The fact that it's difficult doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It absolutely happens, as you have artic- as you have demonstrated, it has happened every time over the last 150 years. <laughs> this, that, that is the nature of this business. It's a capital allocation cycle. That's all it is. That's all it should be. And that is all that we should care about. Um, and so coming out of, you know, out of this 15-year downturn, 2006 to 2020 on returns on capital, and coming out of this shale boom period, and then coming out of COVID and negative $37 oil and the drawdown of duck inventories, which means you had a surge in production in 2021 uh, that was kind of, you know, not for free, but very low cost. I mean, I'm going to suspect there's a choppiness in all that. Whether people are becoming too pessimistic, therefore, on what shale can do, I suspect that might be the case. But again, there are going to be others on this call and other people that run data services that are going to have much more insight to that. But if we are in an environment where oil prices are better and returns on capital are better, this industry will figure out a way to get more out of their resource. That, that is the nature of this business. Um, is there maybe a question in there that returns on capital are peaky if some of the productivity numbers are peaky. And that is something where I would just say, this is assuming that it's going to go away uh, by the end of this decade, probably because people believe in decarbonization can happen that quickly. You know, so I don't, I don't know if 25% is the peak return on capital. I do think it's an above normal return on capital in the context of 50, or as you would show Crude Chronicles, 100 years. But that doesn't mean it's the peak right now and that the next leg is a, is a sustained downturn. Again, with CapEx much closer to trough than to peak, with reinvestment rates much at trough uh, and nowhere near peak, um, I think a period of above normal returns will continue for the, for the foreseeable future. So. So, so Arjun, just to follow on to that before we go on to chaos, um, if you think about full cycle returns and where the stocks are valued, not trying to lead the witness here, but how do you avoid the conclusion the stocks the stocks aren't really attractive? I, I think you'd have to. I, I think the bear case would have to be um, a, 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 an extended period of really, really lackluster economic growth. Um, you could you could always have a worse economic outcome that lasts for a much longer period of time. And so, if something like China, uh, which you know, it's it's not as important to oil demand as it is to say copper or metals demand, but it is still important. And it was a huge part of the growth in the 2000s. I, I think it goes, I think, I think the call would have to be, it's a, it's a really extended um, recessionary period, which, which again, to some degree, I've already said, you don't have the energy supply growth to have the kind of boom like environment or an easy return to that. Um, but I, I would think that that would that's probably then the, the more bearish case. I, I mean, I, I do struggle for it a little bit, but that that I presume is is 
Right. So, 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 Arjun, put it another way. I mean, again, trying to help the average investor at home. I mean, yeah, listen, markets go down. We have a recession. Sure. OK, stocks sell off. But you think about where leadership is and OK, it hasn't really worked so much lately. But going back right to last summer, I was banging the drum of it being long energy and short. You know, as you were kindly reminded me, you know, short lost money uh, technology and that trade being long energy, just using the XOP or XLE as a placeholder. Uh, in short, ARC or whatever um, on the other side of it. I mean, that trade returned like two, three, four X. And so, you know, if we get a recession, you know, say, of course, we're in one, we're going to get one, whatever. But in a world where, you know, we have a recession and oil demand tanks for $50 in double jeopardy, explain to me, you know, just imagine what cash flow negative, loss making, crappy balance sheet, stocks on 10 times sales how they perform so i can still i can still come back to the idea that you know long energy against that garbage like on an absolute return basis i mean i don't know it, to me it still sounds like a great trade what would you say to that i i, I agree completely and I, I won't repeat what you just said because it'd just be repetitive but the relative the relative opportunity i think i would feel much better about than then i mean i am the first one to acknowledge if if S and P earnings are going to fall in half, and the multiple is going to fall in half or go down as well, energy stocks ought to be down on an absolute basis as well. I think they'll do better than than other sectors. And any time you have signs that we've bottomed in the economy and it's going to come back again, you need to go through a capex cycle. We will go through it, but you actually need to go through it. Hundred uh, percent. These things are long term. Hundred percent. All right, chaos, my friend. What's up? Please unmute yourself, chaos. Oops, sorry. Um... Uh, Arjun, thanks for the, tonight's presentation. I, I really appreciate everything that you've discussed. You've touched on um, the topic I'm, I'm about to raise uh, briefly, but I'm working with a charitable board and there's some pressure to go anti-fossil fuel or whatever you want to call it. And um, I can handle the investment thesis side of it and, and talk to them about um, the lack of, of uh, CapEx and, and why that's good but I kind of need to meet them where they are. And um, it would really help me if you can recommend a book or article or an author to follow that talks about some of the bad outcomes uh, from not sufficiently developing the energy complex that we have. And, and one that comes to mind immediately is the situation with Germany shutting down nuclear plants and burning coal. Um, and I, you know, I, I, can't really present something to them that that sort of shoots everything down in a dismissive fashion so if you can think of anything that would be helpful i would really appreciate it yeah no it's it's a, I, I appreciate the question people do need to be met where they are and um i i frankly i think there's a lot that can be done in terms of again for the oil industry it's reducing methane flaring um, I think biodiversity is a topic that both impacts traditional energy, but also impacts the newer energy sources. I mean, there, I mean, it's it's sort of the fundamental nature that all people need energy. Um, Five billion out of the eight billion of us have it. Three billion either don't have enough of it, and maybe somewhere between seven hundred to nine hundred million don't have anything. Um, you know, and and so taking away viable forms of energy based on ideology. Um, you probably, frankly, can't convince people who are so far down that road of anything otherwise. I mean, I always say fly into Mumbai, India, and then on your way to uh, the Taj or whatever fancy hotel we would all stay at, look at the people on the side of the road. There are people who live on the side of the road. They live in tents. The kids are playing there. Can we imagine any of our children playing there? And they are burning cow dung and other bad biomass and breathing it in. And that's their source of energy. Um Maybe we can give them Teslas. Maybe we can give them, uh, we can't give them rooftop solar because they don't have roofs. Um, so um, they need an electric grid and maybe that could be nuclear powered. Uh, maybe there's grid scale solar you could do, but they need energy. Everybody needs energy. Uh, you know, and so um, those aren't always winning arguments for people who don't want to hear it. Um, there are books like Vaclav Schmiel, uh, S-M-I-L. He is Guess, guess what? A Canadian professor, <laughs> in, I think it's the University of Manitoba. He's written some great books that are, I think, just frankly pragmatic about the fundamental and physical nature of energy. My favorite book from Vaclav, uh, Dr. Shmuel, I should say, is Numbers Don't Lie. He's got some newer book that came out. Um, he, he really is a brilliant guy. And I think as best as you can say, he's not an ideologue. So he's not some 
Uh, I don't, you know, I, I've met him once or twice, but I don't know him personally. Um, he's not some right wing person. I don't think he's a left wing person. He's a scientist is what he is. And he writes very good books that goes through the fundamental of energy. I would encourage people to, to read it. It goes through what you would need to do and what you won't, what you can't do to actually have energy transition. Um, it, the, the, the ideology is tough. One of the things I try to do, and it may not quite feel like it on these spaces, uh, and Twitter is Twitter, I do try and engage um, constructively and positively and pragmatically. So I'm involved with, from a policy perspective, what I might call slightly left of center and slightly right of center organizations. And I think there is a need to engage constructively. I, I'm not sure I've 100% done that tonight, but I do try and be positive on these things and People are going to think what they think, but we all need energy, and there's just no question about that. So. Hey, 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 Arjun, thanks for that question for you. You mentioned Crude Conicles. I follow him. He's a must-follow. You mentioned this uh, Dr. Smeal. Are there any other uh, books or Substacks? And, of course, I want you to follow you. Are there any other folks on Twitter or Substacks that you recommend that people um, should follow? I mean, there there is uh, just a ton of great I, – I think – uh, again, I do think everyone should subscribe to your your, your spaces. <laughs> so, you know, I like uh, Macro Voices is one of the podcasts I listen to. Um, I, I listen to Climate One, which is a pretty left of center podcast. Um, I listen to, uh, you know, I try and listen to as many different sources as I can, both traditional left and 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 right too. And, and it kind of spans the range. I mean, there's just so much great content out there. M maybe what I should do rather than struggle with a long, boring answer right now, is I will try and publish all the things I listen to that I like. And again, they do try and span the spectrum. I do try and make it global. I try and make it left and right, if that's the context, or diehard climate versus non-diehard climate, uh, and so forth. And maybe I'll put out a list. Maybe that'll yeah, be I, like I, my yeah, holiday I, substack. So I think that would be great if you really want to help educate people. Hey, George, I, I just read a great book, Retail Gangster, which is about Crazy Eddie. So if you're 65 and I'm 53, you will absolutely remember the Crazy Eddie uh uh, electronic not only, uh, Arjun, Arjun, you just stepped in. Not only I remember it, I was the retail analyst at Fidelity when it, when Crazy Eddie came public. <laughs> oh, oh wow! I wow. had the guy lie to my face. Boy, was he charismatic! I mean, not only that. For those of you who uh, remember John Delorean, Delorean Motors, I was the auto analyst when they came public. I I can tell you story after story after story. So anyway, uh, Arjun, before we before we go to the next questioner. I had one for you. Um, the prior question, I think it was from Chaos, talking about uh, nonprofits. Um, it's been very high profile lately that uh, some of the thought leaders out there, um, some of the elites, I think Harvard, um, Princeton, I don't know if Yale's done it yet, my, my alma mater, they've divested themselves and say they're going to divest. Um, you no doubt have dealt with these institutions, and we'll, and we'll we'll keep them in the federal witness protection program. We're not going to mention them by name, but generically, when you're talking to big funds like that, and they get on the high, they get on their you know on their high horse, and these are non-economic things. You know, it, it could be it could be divestments from whatever, right? Like these guys are thought leaders, and so when they're running in that direction, and then you have, and again, you can't, you're 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 a normal person, so you can't say what I can say, but you look at you know the Black Rocks of the world, and Larry Fink, and all this other stuff, and just really politicized nonsense. I mean, so you have big institutions out there, thought leaders, charging down the field, waving the flag in one direction. Like, what do you? What can you do about that? I mean, because because you know, for a lot of folks, it's it's monkey see, monkey do. Well, if Harvard's doing it, it must be the right thing to do. So, what do you say to that? I think people need to speak up. I think it's very easy to just complain amongst your 10 person text change of either fellow Republicans or whatever people believe in and what, you know, complain about the mainstream media and complain about Harvard elites and Columbia elites and all this kind of, it's why I started my Substack. So I benefit from a networking perspective from it. Um, but I do it also out of just um, dismay at how people talk about energy transition and their kind of willingness to not really understand the nature of energy systems and to think that it's a piece of cake and all you have to do is divest of one and you'll magically get the other one. And there's going to be a heck of a lot of pain along the way. So I, I don't think it's okay anymore. If you know something about something, um, or I guess maybe I'll say it positively, I felt a need to at least write publicly. It doesn't mean I'm right. Anyone who's known my career known I've made many bad calls and I could well not be correct about everything I'm saying tonight. People should totally understand that. 
Uh, but I do think there's a need, but my motivation is not actually in investments. I, I constantly write, it's not an investment blog. It is to try and figure out how can we have more sensible policies going forward? So uh, I, I'm very proud of the fact that I do have environmentalists who read my stuff and engage with me. And I don't view them as the problem. They are there to advocate for the environment. That's their job. The problem are business people and investors who are not doing their homework um, and who are letting themselves get run over by either their ESG. The problem is not ESG. or e Like, George, it, it, where you used to work at Fidelity, where I work at Goldman, is it the ESG team who are going to be the partners of these firms? I mean, maybe more so today than any time. It's going to be the big portfolio managers. It's going to be, it's like, it's going to be the big investment bankers or traders. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that they're driving the boat is ridiculous. It, it, is, it is companies, it is business people um, who are letting themselves get run over. Yeah, I hear you. I hear right? You. And so I think, my, so let me just say quick, I, th I think there is a need if you know something about something, there's no reason to have to be silent about it. There's Substack, there's Twitter, there's lots of different avenues, and I think you have to engage. And I, I try my best to do Arjun, that. Our Arjun, it's like when you go into subways, if you see something, say something. So <laughs> it's sort of like that. <laughs> All is. right. All right, we're going to do a couple more, and then we're going to close this from even more. Uh, I wouldn't go on the subway anymore, though. I might I might advise against well, Actually, I've been in the yeah. subway. Been there, yeah, done that. Okay. All right, okay. So we've got two more questions, and then I'm going to close the room. We're going to go to Mike, Dr. Doom, and then we're going to have Carpathia close the room. Mike, please unmute yourself. The floor is yours. Thanks, guys. Hey, Arjun, I just wanted to ask you real quick, um, because some of the Canadian oil and gas guys uh, back in the start of October brought this up, and then so at the end of – like it was about October 25th, I think the vice chair of the do, 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 do OECD steel committee, she had come out and said that uh, they've seen pretty much a very grave situation build up in the, the like the steel market. And I'm, I was just curious if you've seen any like oil and gas firms, whether that's ENP or farther downstream or like running into difficulties of getting the commodity or the resource in order to actually build out the, the projects that we're going to need in the future to start alleviate some of these problems. I th thank you for the question. And I, I think certainly on the oil and gas side, again, we've not really started to try to do this stuff. So I'd say, you know, in the shale plays, which again have been 70% of supply growth over the previous decade, uh, the, clearly, people are starting to run into some labor issues, some frack crew availability issues and so forth. But in terms of big steel in the ground kind of projects, we're not really doing those. I think someone mentioned Gu uh, Guyana. That clearly, that is one of the few exceptions. Saudi has started investing um, and they seem to be plus or minus on track for what they're doing. But, um, you know, we, we need to start trying to do that. Um, we need to build pipelines. We need new oil sands facilities and so forth. And so I, I think we don't know the answer of how easy or not easy is it going to be when we start. It probably starts off a little more difficult, but ultimately, if profitability is good, if companies have capital, that capital will get invested. But you have to, again, you, I, I keep going back to it. You actually have to go through the cycle. You actually have to spend the money. You can't be sitting here at trough capex and tra trough free investment rates and think the cycle is going to end. Um, you need to get to peak capex and peak reinvestment rates, and then we'll know we're we're further along. So, thanks for that, Mike. Appreciate it. All right, we're, we're, hold on, hold on, Carpathia, just hold it. We're going to Carpathia, but he's not going to be the last. He's going to be the penultimate speaker, and then Alberta um, garbage. You're going to be the last, but uh, please make it a good question because we really want to wrap up this room. Carpathia, floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, George. Um, I was going to address chaos. Um, you know, he's talked to these boards and. Um, at first to ask him how bad do you want to stay on them? But, um, I'd keep it simple. Um, just say you're killing poor people and make them make, you know, put the ball in their court. And, you know, it's, it's patently obvious if anybody wants to do a little research that that's the net effect. Like Arjun said in, in India. Anyway, that's all I wanted to help him. But I mean, I have very little patience anymore, um, in that regard. It, 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 it's, it's a fact now. It, it's, yeah, we can debate about it, but if you really want to push this, look what Florida's doing, look what Texas did. It's, it's simple. How bad you want to hurt the lower economic strata. And that's it. Thank you, George. Always love Thanks, you, Carpathia. Carpathia. You always hit the nail on the head. All right, let's, uh, let's go to uh, Alberta Garbage to close the room. Alberta Garbage, good to see you. What's up, man? Thank you, Arjun. Always appreciate it when you come on here and share your thoughts. Um, you know, I can certainly echo what you're saying 
you know, the CapEx cycle hasn't, hasn't really even started. And to the question that was about steel, um, I've actually been observing uh, prices and availability, the uh, prices going down and availability increasing for oil country steel tubing, um, which says to me that, you know, people are not pushing CapEx to the max. Um, it's just not to, to, to echo Argent, the CapEx cycle hasn't even started yet. So how could it end if it hasn't started? Anyway, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on here. Alberta Garbage, great to hear from you. Appreciate you being here. So, Arjun, with that, we're going to, man, you really are glutton for punishment. Two and a half hours. This is awesome. So, uh, uh, Arjun, I hope you will, uh, actually, Gnostic always has a nice way of closing these rooms, but I'm going to make, make my two cents, and I'm going to leave it to Gnostic. So, Arjun, this has been phenomenal, really. Um, you've, you've helped so many people. This will probably be heard by, I'm going to guess when it's all said and done, 20, 25,000 people. Um, so, you know, two, thousand, two or 3,000 people live. 90% of the people that listen to these on a recorded basis as you do, and not just uh, on Twitter, but as you know, uh, as you rightly pointed out, they're on YouTube and Spotify and Apple. So you are making a difference, Arjun. You're not talking into just an echo chamber of oil crazies. Um, this has been awesome. You, are one, you have an obligation, you really do, to speak out as you have. Uh, one of the things I, I say quite often is that the folks um, who, some of the older crowd, I'm not going to call it be old, but you're older, but those who have the knowledge base, many of them uh, have lost their voice. They're, they're not being heard adequately in the public square. They've been canceled, not by politics, but by technology. You, I'm very impressed. You're into Twitter and all these other things. That's great. But so many of the others, like they just, they don't, they don't go into social media and their voice gets lost. And it's really a shame because, um, there's such a wealth of information out there. It's just, it's not getting, it's not, it's not being heard loudly enough. And so I thank you for the bottom of my heart, Arjun, for doing this and everything you're doing. I urge everyone to follow Arjun. Um, he's got a sub stack. It's absolutely terrific. And Arjun, I hope you enjoyed this enough that we can, uh, we can coerce you, convince you into coming back again in the future. This is on behalf of everybody in the room. I, I really want to, really want to thank you. This, this has been absolutely awesome. Um, and, and with that, Gnostic, um, I'm going to leave it to you to close the room. Gnostic, the floor is yours. Arjun, thank you very much. There were so many people in this room uh, that are oil people that George could have pulled up. Tremendous number of people. Thank you for having me on stage, George. And Arjun, please do come back. I know there's like, I can just see the Canadian oil mafia down there with a whole bunch of questions. Michael, everybody else. There's so many people in here. The question I was going to ask was actually answered by somebody in the room uh, and posted. It was, what, what's the name of the author that you mentioned? But somebody already answered me, and I'll try and post it a little later. Uh, but thank you very much for being here. Much appreciated. George and Gnostic, thank you very much for having me. Again, I love these spaces. I think you guys are doing the real service and bringing so many great speakers, some of whom I, I, I can see in the audience here. And so it, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you, RJ, and look forward to speaking with you again. And thanks to everyone. This has been awesome. We're gonna ha we have a room later this week. I think it's on Wednesday at four four thirty with the great Michael Howell out of London, cross border capital. Uh, he's coming back to update us on his views of uh, global liquidity. Uh, we have a room set up as well for next week. I haven't announced it yet, but Michael Howell uh, Wednesday. I think it's four four thirty p.m. Eastern. Uh, check it out. It's a can't miss. He's, a, he's been in the room many times. He's a favorite of the room. So again, Arjun, thank you so much and I look forward to speaking with you again. Good night, everybody. Take care. Hi, George.